podcast begins this summer. This movie has no quotes page. <laughs> no, it's brand new. <laughs> David, that doesn't stop. IMDb, user editors, most of the time. People are usually adding shit the second a trailer comes up. I don't think. Adding it to the quotes page and then putting in brackets from the trailer. I don't think anyone Was who's seen this Was there dialogue in the trailer? Yeah. Mm, not much. It's but dialogue I don't think... like, I'm going to get on this horse. I don't think anyone who's seen this film knows how to operate IMDb. <laughs> they might know how to go to it. It's possible. But like knows how to edit IMDb. Uh -huh. That's so true. The The tagline for this movie is the American saga begins this summer. Well, no lies detected. No lies detected. Okay, great. The American saga does begin this summer. Okay, what's I next? Can, I can say that unilaterally about this movie. It absolutely begins. Does it end? We're not sure yet. I, I think this movie does not end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that. This uh, nice Cinemark exclusive trailer mm -hmm. calls it the story of a nation unsettled. Ooh. Not, not, I mean, once again, no lies detected. No lies detected. Now I'm looking at the character posters. Whoa, there's a lot of them. Really? I, I'm like, even just searching Horizon and American Saga quote, I'm not finding anything. On any site. Who's your favorite? T tag yourself. Ooh, I'm Abby Lee. Posters. I know I'm Abby Lee. There's no question about that. There's no question yeah, you're I'm like, Abby I don't want to go. Where We got to go somewhere? <laughs> like, her whole arc is like, what? <laughs> Can't I just hang out? I still am we not. We got to go. Is the baby hers or no. Jenna no, Malone's? It's Jenna Malone's. Malone. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's Jenna Malone's baby. She is looking after the baby. I think this whole episode it's gonna is going to be a lot, lot of, of this. Wait, what? what? Who is that guy doing, though? Is what, that what the now? same kid or is that a different kid? If this is <laughs> Same kid. No, no, I'm saying Oh, oh yeah, that's... yeah, sure, sure, sure. This yeah. is how Griffin and I watch the entire movie with, with hushed, hushed voices going, did we meet this person yet? <laughs> did we already know this? Yes. You spent 30 minutes thinking Abby Lee was Annalyn McCord. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed about it, and I wasn't going to bring it up. Who's Anna Lynn McCord She's again? She's like the crazy lady from the Beverly Hills 90210 reboot who like read some poem the about first reboot. Not like the if second. I were the, not the, the one, one just called 90210. Right. Yeah, they did a yeah, yeah, yeah. they did a second one, which was the original cast in a meta show. It was almost like a Cobra Kai. Oh, weird! But they're well, the actors. That cultural moment completely yeah. passed me by. But yeah, I thought it was Anna Lynn McCord, and I was like to to Griffin, I was like, "This is this woman's a crazy person," and he was Anna like, Lynn McCord does a lot of stuff on social media that's yeah, a little unhinged. I mean, she seems a little oh, like Q adjacent. Yes, uh, she references the storm uh, a lot, which I don't know if she's referencing the Q storm or some other storm, but like that's great. like this is a great way to start. First a line in bio, but yeah, anyway, talking about someone who's not not in the movie in this movie, no. And then, um, then Gr Griffin was like, "Oh, is Abby Lee crazy?" I was like, "Oh, it's a it's, it's Abby, Abby Lee. Lee. Sorry, my mistake. But I apologize." Marie, Marie was looking with great concern. Like from the moment Abby Lee entered on yeah. screen, I was like, "What's going wrong?" Yeah, I was. I was upset. I was like, this, "We're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here, casting wise." But you know, I I think about how the nine hundred two one zero reboot titled 90210 on the CW. Yes, featured, which was very much a post-Gossip Girl. CW yes. is trying to build out. Ran for five seasons. And Anna Lynn McCord was tapped with a similar kind of like Blake Lively energy. And then that show very quickly did not become a full phenomenon, even though it lasted five seasons. And she sort of disappeared other than being the world's best poster. I remember that Tristan Wilds was on it. Who was Tristan Wilds? He was in The Wire. He played Michael Lee, one of the, the great characters in The Wire that's introduced in the school season. Mm. And it was just so funny that he had gone from that character in The Wire to, I assume, someone who sits in a pool a lot of the time in 902. It's just like, like it's like, hey, you got to shoot in Baltimore. It's going to be a lot of like really dingy stuff. Like you're on the streets, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just like, what's your role on 902 and a pool man? What has it been? It's just before we start to record, Got to make this one a short one. Yeah, we got to go, we got to start. <laughs> we got to get into we it. Gotta get we do got to get into and it. And then I'm, I'm and I'm just <laughs> watching losing it, it unfolds before my Ben's eyes. Losing it. You kidding me? Okay. I'd be the Tom Payne character poster. I'm looking at the Tom Payne character poster. He has my cuck energy. <laughs> He's Tom, the only one who <laughs> he's the little glasses guy. He's the British guy who's. Oh yeah, he's who's a, he's, like, he's, 
He's well, a loser. Like, we're all allowed 50 <laughs> drugs of water a day yeah. here, right? Luke was like, come on, Making man. Making his little drawings. So, sorry to be a bother. Would you mind not <laughs> looking at my wife's nips? Can we all just say this right now? Yeah. I want to just see if everyone agrees. Yeah. The best plot line is Luke Wilson's wagon No train, question. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. That yes. it comes in two hours and is kind of almost an L because you're like, I could have been with this wagon train the whole time. I was so in every time they went to the plot line. And I'll say like the Tom Payne and Ella Hunt characters are kind of driving me crazy, but drive me crazy in a way where I felt really engaged. You were yeah, engaged. I, I wanted to see them killed. I, right. I was like, <laughs> it's horror movie They better shit. get scalped ben, ben, by the end of this movie. Do you disagree? I, I I saw this movie last night in the middle of the night, <laughs> so it's kind of a blur to me. Uh, Welcome to Blank Check. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. Who else is here? Uh, Marie. Barty. And Ben. Possibly. Uh, this is a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers, such as making Dances with Wolves. I like that you said directors. Directors. Like director actors. Sure. Like that wasn't intentional, but I'm going to own it. It's really now. cool. Yeah. yeah. Directors who win Best Picture and Best Director and make a film that grosses hundreds of millions of dollars worldwide and then basically spend the rest of their career as a filmmaker chasing that to a certain extent. Kevin Costner looks out on the horizon and goes, I think I know where I'm going. <laughs> Everyone follow me. Everyone does for a while. Uh, they get, get a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes those checks clear, sometimes they bounce baby, and sometimes. You're not given the check. Sometimes you have to whip open your own checkbook. Yes. Put the money down. Sell a couple of waterfront properties, maybe. And insist upon the public that you are making four of these. Today we're talking about one of the wildest gambles in a long time. Horizon, an American saga, chapter one. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a colon and an M dash. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is, our, of course, our series on the films of Kevin Costner podcasts with wolves. Oh! Thank you, Marie. Thank you. David, you saw this movie at a screening? I did. I saw it at Warner Media. Was it an afternoon? Uh, yeah, it was a 1 p.m. screening, a mm -hmm. mercifully scheduled 1 p.m. screening at that uh, Hudson Yards. Marie and I saw an 11.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. At the Alamo, see, so you had what I really would have liked, which is essentially a meal break. Yes. yes. So that was intentional. <laughs> of course. That's we, how it, I would have done it. We did not see this film at, on a big screen. No, it, it was, was in one little, of the little shoebox, shoebox theaters. Well, and, all yeah. those Manhattan, Manhattan ones yeah. are small. Yeah. But I mean, the screen's still pretty sizable. But we, You're but, close you know, to we it. sacrificed the vistas for the, the sustenance. But there was this question. You had seen it. I was like, hey, Ben, Marie, let's figure out when all three of us can go see Horizon together. I don't want to leave one sad soldier fighting horizon alone <laughs> and it was a thing where it was just like marie can only do saturday yeah look or, it, you know, it, it was, was tough to do marie could only do sunday dave ben could only do saturday and i i put my thumb down and i was like ben i'd rather do the daytime sunday than the evening saturday so we went we saw it the right time which is you wake up get you, some coffee you have five cups of coffee <laughs> you order three more cups at your seat you watch horizon ben I went on my halonesome <laughs> to go see a screening at 10 p.m. So it technically started at 10.30. And Astoria Queens, right. At 10.30. Right, you had to sit through trailers. You texted yeah. us at 10.27, the title card coming up. Yep. Yes. And yes. I said, that title's just getting started. Because what you texted <laughs> us just was just horizon. the word Horizon. There's more to There's come. There's more to come. So we got, many a, chapters? we got a text from Ben at 9.58 p.m. <laughs> Alone. My private horizon. Just been empty completely ass. empty theater. That's correct. I was the only soul and in that, the theater. That remained true? Yes. Wow. Paul Rubin's dream. No one even came in to like have some anonymous sex or something. Like An employee came in and was like, oh, surprised <laughs> to see me there. Kevin came in and shook your hand personally. <laughs> uh, David threatened to show up at 1130 and rob your sleeping <laughs> I body. you'd be asleep by then. I'll just, just going to lift your you wallet. Said, you said you had bought popcorn and I said that Costner paid for the kernels himself. Uh, and then this, this quote from Alex Baron is funny. Kevin Costner has the wide open expanses of the American West. Ben has Theater 5 at the Kaufman Astoria. The UA Kaufman Astoria, which I love. United Artists, the theater chain, has long been owned by Regal. 
That is the one that is still just like, we haven't bothered to reprint it. The UA. Relax. It's the UA. You get I, it. I love that theater. It's though. great. It's not, I mean, they've done it up, it seems like, in, in regal finery at this point. They yeah. got the recliners yeah. and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that theater is a, a little hidden gem. It's just, if you're in New York City and you want the suburban movie going experience, right. that's the place to go. It absolutely feels like a mall movie theater. Like, the, the people that work there are not like currently at NYU studying to be filmmakers. Makers. They are like pimply high school kids. You're surrounded yeah. by, by eggheads like us. Yeah. You're with the real America. The America that Kevin Costner dreams of. It's really funny that he's a California guy. Kevin Costner? The right. man just, like, literally grew dude. up in Compton. Right. I just think he, there's something, I, I don't think he's disingenuous. I don't think he's ever pretending. But his spirit, you're like, did this guy emerge out of a literal like tumbleweed? Out of like an eagle's eye. Right, in Montana. <laughs> yeah. Did he crawl out of the rocks? No. Like so many Montana residents, he moved there once he got rich. <laughs> and I, by the way, I mean, you know, people who own vast swathes of land in Montana. Um, Kevin Costner has directed Horizon and American Saga for chapter one for us. We've all seen it. He did it for us. He did it kind of for us. We uh, have done a little Kevin Costner series and we've had fun with this silly, silly man. And look, we we decide these things fairly uh, far in advance. A couple months ago, we were like, should we fucking do it? We've talked about Costner for a while. He's such a fascinating figure and Horizon's such a big gamble. And the question was like, how is this thing going to pan out? We're committing to doing him before we get to see it. This is one of the weirdest things. He's had a really fun press tour that's been, justified our decision. I absolutely. And I think talking about the previous movies, I think you're seeing a lot of movie podcasts doing this. Uh, Big Picture did their fucking great Kevin Costner Hall of Fame episode uh, that almost broke out into <laughs> fisticuffs. But like just Amanda and Sean trying to interrogate, like, what is he? He is such an endlessly fascinating figure as like this weird like American West Sphinx and like at his rise at his peak in the 80s and 90s when he has his moment of kind of inarguably being the guy for a couple years he was throwbacky at that point he was like an 80s 90s movie star who's like we got to roll things back to the way they were in the 40s and 50s and now in the 2020s he's like we got to roll things back to how I did them in the 80s and 90s and it's like you mean when you were then throwing back to the 40s and 50s and he remains so adamant of like, I don't care what anyone thinks. I'm not chasing trends. I got to do things my way. And Fran, our friend Fran Hoffner, wrote this great fucking piece about him. I've seen this from a lot of people where there's something so square about him that when we were growing up, our people, our generation, our age, he seemed kind of lame. He was like, this is the ultimate dad movie star. And now I feel like there is something that almost feels transgressive about how square he is where he is so against the tide of what's happening, which has made the idea of, like, wouldn't it be great if Horizon just proves fucking everyone wrong? If, like, his audience just rolls out in droves and it's this kind of success that no one could anticipate. It's an artistic triumph. Um, I had not seen a Costner-directed film until I watched Dances with Wolves this week. Oh, so you still haven't seen... The, the Postman? A Tandy Letter was put on a hat? And you still haven't... I mean, I, I, the, the open range. Is that mm -hmm. what it's called? Open range? Yeah. I, Griffin told me I would really like open range, you but will, um, unfortunately. It has a monologue about chocolate delivered by Robert Duvall. It, it that sounds great. Rolls. And I, yes. did, I, I didn't even realize like Annette Benning's in it. She's all over that fucking thing. Sounds you kidding great. me? Yeah. Sounds great. And I, uh, so I will watch by, I mean, by the Michael time. Michael Gambon this plays a mean Irishman? Great. That's how, that's how we love to see him. I mean, by the time this episode airs, I will have seen every. Kevin Costner But you're movie. still really trying to but wrap your I'm head around it. I'm trying to wrap my head around him. Whereas David, Ben, and I are deep You in guys it. are deep in Costner. Well, you have worked with him as we've talked about. Yes. The close, the, your close personal friend. One of my I've best worked friends. with him in that I find watching his movies to be to like be work. work. <laughs> Same. I, no, I love the guy. My my like experience of Kevin Costner is mostly through Madonna colon Truth or Dare. Sure. A, a film with one of his better performances. Correct. Yeah. Where he, you know, goes backstage at a Madonna show yeah. tells her her show was neat and she immediately like 
doesn't know how to respond, gets totally grossed out, and then does like the like vomit thing. Neat. What kind of loser is Kevin Costner? Mm. That to me was Kevin Costner. Sure. Wow. That, that has framed your perception. And you were talking about Madonna right before this episode about seeing her at a restaurant once and not being able to eat because you were so transfixed. Correct. I was. So you yeah. follow what Madonna does. I Madonna did. framed your perception of Correct. Kevin Costner. So, and I'm, you know, I, I'm a woman, not to be gender essentialist or whatever, but like, Westerns have never really been my thing unless they're like rev they're revisionist Westerns or like commenting on masculinity or, you know, American power or whatever. Um, but we were talking about this walking out of the theater, how like Costner sort of in in this very self mythologizing press tour he's been doing for Horizon, both pumping up Horizon and looking back on his career and patting himself on the back for all the times he was correct. Right. And his sort of strategy, he always talks about, like, I'm not afraid to make the kind of men's movies that people don't make for men anymore. But also the reason I'm successful is because I think about my female audience. And you watch it and you're like, here's the thing. Marie's making a face that I don't disagree with. I'm making like the Robert De Niro, like. But I also think. They showed up more than men. If you, the box office. They did this weekend. And if you yeah. look at like the six years of his like absolute dominance, that was clearly the X factor going on with him. And sometimes a lot of the ways it felt like, I mean, he he does try to establish these strong female characters. He like sort of objectifies himself in an interesting way. Yes. Uh, in a lot of his movies. Right. And there's something very like uh, uh, arrogant about it. But you watch him in his movies be like, well, obviously women are coming to see my butt. I got to show my butt in Robin Hood. One more, one more shot. Let's get it into For Love of the Game. Really, right. Kevin? Right. What? I have yeah. never. The only time I've ever been attracted to Kevin Costner was in that clip from Tony Scott's Revenge that was circulating on Twitter of recently. Of them driving normally. Yes. In their of him car. and Madeline Stowe being normal in having the car. a normal drive <laughs> um, and doing normal things to a I think, mas, mas, mas. He, You don't think he's hot in No Way Out? He's really hot. Bull Durham. No, yeah. Bull Durham. He's really. Bull Durham is when he's hot. He's he just is, doesn't, do do, 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 do. Yeah. doesn't do anything for me. But I will say. The one thing that helped unlock Kevin Costner for me, and I don't know if you've brought this up yet because I haven't listened to the the episodes, you know, because the way we're recording this, that he is like Barbara Streisand, but for boys. Did you talk about this? No. Okay. I great. don't know if we have. I, I look. This was not game. I mean, he's like Barbara Streisand, way. and the, the reaction from our Reddit was very similar yeah. to us doing him. Correct. So, but but I think these two careers are paired in a lot of ways. It's interesting yes. that we're covering them both within the same uh, year, and I think there are certain like everything that's powerful about him also feels very in conversation with his like humongous blind spots, which is also Barbara. You know, where you're just like, there are the ways in which they are like, this is what I, the story I need to tell. And then there are the things they are saying even louder than their intent that are so reflective of their mind and their worldview that are so fascinating to me. We get to, not to jump way ahead in this movie, but we get to the scene where Abby Lee basically as a thank you, as, yes. as a return act of <laughs> no, kindness, no. fucks a sleeping Kevin Costner. <laughs> I think and, she's kind of... Trying to like distract him too, right? I, I mean, know, I it thought is, it was like a farewell. Like, I think we're that was we're the gonna vibe. fucking dissect yeah. this scene at length. But Marie goes, What is the sex scene? And knowing she hasn't watched the other Costner movies, I was like, Marie, get ready. You're gonna see this scene play out two more times. Kevin Costner has like a fetish for like there is laying there. Some <laughs> thing going on here. Because <laughs> Postman's gonna give you six minutes of this. Yeah. No, Postman is very normal. And the way that happens is regular. It happens all the time that a husband approaches Kevin Costner and is like, please, your sperm. The amount of she Kevin needs Costner it. movies where a woman <laughs> comes up to him and is like, I assume you want sex. And he's like, no, I'm not interested. I'm looking out into the distance right now. I'm going to get naked. It's like, happening. And then, but then no, a, an hour. The water. He's like, I, I could never. <laughs> an hour later, the woman comes back and she just starts fucking him. Yeah, okay. And he's like, why are you doing this? And they're like, because you didn't want it. Right. And then and they're like, and you're good at this somehow. Yeah, I know. I know. And also your cum is our gold. In 1988, a couple years after the success, mild success of Silverado, a he film he was in. Starting to become successful. I think Silverado was an MGM film, a United Artists film. 
Uh, geez, back to the UA Kaufman Astoria with you. He's talked about how him popping in Silverado. No, it was Sony. It was, it was Columbia. Sony. Yeah. Okay. They came to him and were like, we want to actually be in business with you. Here are scripts we have. We feel like you're a, a leading man on the cusp. So he's starting to already think about, I'm developing my own projects, even though he hasn't really been tested as the guy yet. I just know that he had made Silverado and he wanted to make another Western, a darker one. He was like this. I made my Saturday matinee Western. I made my sort of for fun kids Western. Can I make my searing epic? He turns to Mark Kasdan. Brother of? Lawrence Kasdan, director of Silverado. Um, and he turns to him and says, uh, do you want to write me maybe like a two-hander Western and like, we can see where we go from there. And out of that comes the character Hayes, mm -hmm. uh, Hayes Ellison, Hayes that, Ellison. uh, that Kevin Costner plays in this movie. Right. You might've noticed that he, uh, his son is in this film in a primary role and that his son is named Hayes Costner. And a lot of people surmised, oh, he must have named his character, the one that Kevin plays in Horizon, after his son. And the reality is he named his son after the character that was written for him in 1988 that he He's has had this name for a long time. It's true. Uh, this character, Hayes, lived in a town called Sidewinder. Eventually that would become Horizon. Right. I mean, this is one of the early concepts he's really into is. All these Westerns are built around this small town, this local economy, this America that's building itself. I want to make the movie about the town, how the town comes to exist. Hmm, sounds like a TV show to me. Well, certainly in the 80s, that would not have been less of a thing. And uh, no one wants to produce the script. He said it was a single movie. It was a two-hander, a conventional Western with a beginning, middle, and end. And I couldn't get anyone to make it. Time passes. Mm -hmm. Other Costner movies that are Westerns come along. Dances with Wolves. Why he makes himself. He wins the Oscar. It's a huge hit. Do you know who gives the best picture Oscar to Kevin Costner? Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand. She sure did. She sure did. Why Wyatt Earp, another cast in Project. The Postman, which he makes himself. Open Range, which uh, Costner directs and is wonderful. Marie and I were talking about this on Sunday. Kevin Costner recently came up in the Cinematrix and the grid was Western. Pick a Western with Kevin Costner. And we were like, ostensibly, there are only five that are actual Westerns. Yeah, we just named them all. But yet, you could argue that like 75% of the movies this guy has made feel like Western Westerns. Vibes. What are we talking about? James Mangold over here? Secretly. <laughs> Secretly a Western. That's the thing, though. It's a like, perfect, or is, it a, is it a perfect world? Perfect world feels very Western. Yeah, of course. Revenge, wherever it takes place. Feels Western-y in some Western of the tropes. His very presence feels Western-y. Dragonfly? I haven't seen it. A Death Western. Um, Is that the one directed by Tom Shady? Tom Shady, Tom Shady. Yeah, yeah, we'll we're cover definitely covering. Years. Yeah. After Open Range, Costner goes to Disney and says, come on, I've got this script. Open Range was just kind of like a solid on base double hit. or triple. They're <laughs> like, you know what? You found a good model. You kept this movie. Sort of, uh, he kept it the right size. I think Kevin's still trying to overcome his reputation for being an out of control over budget, over schedule maniac from the 90s, especially as a star is dimmed. And Open Range, it's like he delivered it. It did well. It's going to continue to do well on DVD. They're like, can you give us another one of these? He said they had a $5 million difference when it came down to um, uh, budget, and they didn't make the movie. At this point, it's still the two-hander script. Yes. Uh, one movie. And then it dawned on him. Every Western always has a town. These towns are fought over. There was struggle. The land was important. The Native Americans had already picked the best places to settle, and now us white people go, we'll, we'll just take this. And I wanted to think of the idea of, what if we re reverse engineered it and we said, let's go there when there's no town. How did it start? What's the mythology? And so all of this starts churning in his brain. In 2011, he seriously restarts this uh, with a writing partner, John Baird, who had written... Um, was some sort of illustrated novel called The Explorer's Which Guild Costner with Kissner. Costner? Right Costner bankrolled this, said it was going to be a four-part book. Only the first one has ever come out. I just ordered it. I only found out about it the other day, so I will have read it by the time we get to our Horizon Chapter 2 episode. It is like, yeah, an, a, a book series that never concluded or never continued about the American frontier 
that is apparently indebted to Tintin in its illustration style. Sounds cool. It sounds very fascinating. Coster says a Baird who apparently was in the band Lustra, who had the song Scotty Doesn't Know in Eurotrip. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great, great moment. So random. But I think JJ made a point of saying he we're not didn't sure play on that. We're one. not sure. We're the not credits sure. are unclear. He was part of that band, but perhaps not for their biggest moment. Costner says, John's a big research guy. I'm a human behavior guy. He goes back and forth between us. So I assume John does all the work. And then Costner's like, Yeah, but he would fuck Abby Lee at this point. Let's write that in. He's her coming out of his <laughs> mouth, but she's coming really hard. I just can't get over it. <laughs> all of the, everything I just said is alleged. For all I know, Kevin Costner writes and flames come out of his pen every time he does. But I don't everything know. I just said is a direct quote. <laughs> um, um, their, their vision for the project. America's expansion to the West was one that was fraught with peril and intrigue from natural elements, interactions with indigenous peoples who lived on the land, and the determination and ruthlessness of those who thought to so, sought to settle it. Horizon tells the story of that journey in an honest and forthcoming way. Now, I just want to just restate. He spent 20 years that spanned the absolute rise and fall and then sort of vague rebounding of his movie star career and his currency in Hollywood, trying to get a focused two-hander off the ground. And after 20 plus years, his takeaway was, I should make four of them. No one's giving me money for one. The problem is, this is too contained. I should make this unwieldy. He's been in interviews basically saying this, like, I'm such an idiot that everyone told me no, and I figured, well, if it's hard to get one of them made, I should make it four instead. It's almost like it's a bit of a blank check project. Uh, also, he there's lots of quotes where he's like, the story involves lots of women, uh, you know, uh, the West doesn't carry on without women, and if they, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, you know, uh, does that placate you, Marie? Yeah, Marie, do you Actually, feel good? women are at the center of this story. Do you feel good now, Are they? <laughs> I, I said to you guys, I was like, if you pointed a gun at me, I would call Sienna Miller the quote-unquote most important character in this movie. But that's a huge stretch, because it's there's really just multiple parallel storylines. It's really hard to pick a there's no real lead. Women at the center of the story. If you pause this movie at one hour and 30 minutes, there, <laughs> there might, might be a, a woman, woman on the screen. screen. There yeah. could be. I mean, I guess I just went into this movie figuring Costner would be the center of gravity. And then you realize, like, now nah, he's kind of like a C plot like character. There's this fascinating <laughs> structural thing where the movie is like intertwining plots from the beginning. It's not broken up into like sections. You could absolutely see this being more Buster Scruggsy. Right, chapter one. Yes. Like, this whole movie yes. is chapter one, correct? That is correct. But it's not divided like, you right. know. And the first <laughs> that's yeah. why it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> the first hour, we're cross-cutting between a couple different narrative yeah. threads. And then one hour in, you introduce Costner. So, and now he's getting worked in, yeah. as are a couple other and side threads. And then we threads. don't meet the wagon people until... Hour two. Hour two. So it's very... One, yeah. Regimented. One right. thing yeah. I just want to just so the audience, you know, listeners feel like they're there with us. Um, Griffin at one point, 40 minutes into the movie goes, I really have to be. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I'm not leaving. Well. Until I see how Costner is introduced. We've told this story on, on our Batman Begins episode where similarly I had a horrible nosebleed and I wouldn't go to the bathroom until Batman came on screen. I, I turned yeah. to my friends and said, I'm not leaving until he says I'm Batman. And I had the same thing of like, I need to see how Costner shoots himself. If he's taking an hour before he brings himself on screen. I think screen. the shot's in the trailer, but honestly, it was thrilling to we see. We both kind of gasped and yeah. you were just like, that's movie star That's movie star shit. shit. Yeah. You cut an hour in, new fucking establishing card. A line of horses, and then without the focus shifting, Costner just rides directly into the center of the frame perfectly in yeah. focus mm. and just holds a look for yeah. like 15 seconds. Yeah, it was good. And you feel some juice of like, that is an undeniable movie star on screen now. And then I proceeded to take a shit. I took three shits during this movie, I want to say. Which speaks to just kind of... It speaks to length, but also, I would say it speaks to you more yeah, than the film's length. That many cups crazy, of coffee. Griffin. Okay. <laughs> I don't care. I don't go to the bathroom it's at all during this trail. movie. But I did have horrible <laughs> acid reflux when I got home. Well, what'd you eat? Philly cheesesteak. Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> oh, and a coffee. At the Alamo draft house. <laughs> yeah, so... That might do it to yeah. you. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh um, boy. But yeah, it was really painful. I thought I was having a heart attack. Yeah. When you got ba home? Bad acid reflux. No, it happened really like two hours you. after I got okay. home from Horizon. Yeah. But I was really like, I, I oh. was really scared. I like, couldn't feel my hands. I was like, wow. Yeah. But no, it was just really bad acid reflux from Horizon. Are you sure you weren't just deep in thought of how America was formed? And how, um, let me read another quote here. Uh, I'm not looking for kudos because women are in it. For me, they're <laughs> not in it. They actually dominate the movie, to be honest. Each one of these women dominate while they're on the screen. That's like him saying, like, anytime a woman's on the screen, she her whole body is visible. Yeah. She's standing there. Is on screen, I am laying down and she is mounting me. Yes. As a thank you. I mean, there was it's also just one of those things where it's like, Kevin, shh. Yeah, there's honestly plenty of women in the film. You do not need to suddenly be like, uh, if if anything, there aren't any men in the film. Yeah, like, you know, like going on like a reverse. For our sake, for the podcast, I'm like Kevin. Never stop talking. Okay, Don't censor yourself <laughs> at all. He, I mean, I've just been watching, listening to like every interview of him I can find, and it is a point made on Big Picture this week. The fact that Horizon Part Two comes out only six weeks after this one is he just going to stay on the campaign trail for the entire summer? Great question. There are so many more banana smoothies for him oh, to try. That's a good shake. <laughs> um, he was saying that obviously he put up most of the money for this movie, or at least a, a chunk of it, a good chunk of it, yes. a good percentage of it. Uh, he is just a, a pure distribution deal with New Line of Warner Brothers for this, but the film plays at the Cannes Film Festival. And it was going to be on his dime, any of the sort of can related expenses. And he went to the men of the cast and he was like, look, I'd be the one paying out of pocket to fly people out. And I think the right thing to do, if all of you agree, is I only bring the women out. And so at Cannes, it was just him walking the fucking staircase, walking the quasette or whatever with all of the women in the cast. Sure. So. And I think he presented it as like, I want to give them their moment. Sienna Miller. Jenna Malone, Abby Lee, Ella Hunt, Isabel Furman, uh, other people, I assume. Right, and so his read is just like, this is the generous thing to do. This is the gentlemanly thing to do. And I listen to that, I'm like, that is also huge divorce guy energy of being yeah. like, you know what? If I'm paying out of pocket, I just want to be surrounded by eight beautiful Ladies women. Ladies in ball gowns. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you some more uh, Costner quotes here because he's normal. Uh, there's real drama in how people cross this country. There's always this tendency to think it was a simpler time. It was infinitely more difficult. Does you're anyone dealing, think it was a simpler? You're dealing with unknowns, Everyone Marie. Everyone thinks it was simpler. You didn't know where you were going. You had to arbitrate your own problems. When you were confronted by issues, you had to make up your mind very quickly in tough situations. Sometimes life and death situations. Try that on a daily basis and see if you don't want to live with your computer and shit. I mean... Uh, Come on, he brought it home. Speaking of computers and shit, I mean, my childhood... We had a whole fucking computer game about how hard it was to, That's true. Yeah. to move it, westward. But it made it seem hard, but it also made it seem like you just pushed a button every so often you and once in a while dysentery. you would die. Yes. yes. They're also like cannibal shit. Yeah. And then remember when you had to hunt and it's like you're like shooting in a circle. Also, it's really I, hard to I get those guys. Ben the, knows. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was very into the American Girl yes. you know, series. Yes. I'm surprised. People are always... Yeah. People are always fucking dying. Well, yeah. that's part of why Kirsten's little girls... best friend got collar or whatever. She's fucking Kirsten's dead. Might Swedish be one of the, one? Yeah. the yeah. most tragic Homesteaders. toy line of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they should do that in Home Story. The, uh, home Story. Horizon Story. Toy Story. Have some American, American Girl, girl dolls, dolls show up. Yeah. The, Mattel's saving that for its own movie. Well, they made one, didn't they? Kit Kittredge they made American no, Girl. But now they're doing it, some Isn't bigger. like Lena Dunham doing She's an American Girl? She's Pocket. Oh, okay. Never mind. With Lily Collins, of course. Hollywood. Let's Onward keep these and upward. Um, Let's also say uh, Oregon Trail is being made as a comedy parody musical movie. Great. So I think Pasek and Paul are writing an Oregon Trail good. comedy I think, movie. I think they should do that. Leaving I want body. that to be released in my favorite <laughs> Cineplex. Hell. All right. Costner says, look, there was great injustice in the West. And there was, but that doesn't minimize the courage it took for ancestors to cut loose and go out there. Minimizes it a little bit, but whatever. That's my editorializing. But I do think that's kind of what Costner is going for with Horizon, colon, and American Saga, M Dash Chapter One. He's kind of like, this, what they were doing was kind of awful. Yes. And they kind of were walking into, you know, death almost deservedly. These people going like far beyond America at that point, right? But at the same time, there's 
there's something stirring about it, right? They're going at, like he's trying to balance an old Western and a neo Western, and it sort of works at times. At times, let's just get this out of the way. Thirty four minutes into the episode, that's it. Only thirty four. I think let's wrap it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've, been, we've talked about the scene where Abby Lee fucks Costner, and I yeah. feel like that's all we needed to cover. Hong Shu, Hong Shu. Um, no, I didn't say let's end things. No, what I do said, you want to get out of the way? This is in many ways less of a movie than any movie we've ever covered on the show. As much as in many ways it's so much movie, it is almost impossible to actually engage with this thing as a complete object because it isn't. It is the most incomplete. It is essentially four to five. Fragment. Right stories that begin and don't even really get to a middle. No. And then the movie the movie ends in that there is no longer pictures on the screen. But the movie doesn't end like even with the kind of like looking over the horizon type Empire Strikes Back type Ah, oh, well, what awaits us next? It just stops. It doesn't even telling it doesn't the end with like lost style cliffhangers of like holy no, shit. No, it ends with a sizzle reel. I it said out loud to Griffin yeah. this season on the rise. It there, does have a sizzle reel. This montage this, begins uh, it, at the end of the film that at first I was like, well, this is this kind of multi part story ending that you're used to where they do a montage to just remind you where we're leaving all the characters. Captain America does this. Uh, right. Matrix uh, Reloaded does this. But that's this. what it feels like. It feels yes. like you're watching the montage that's just like keeping tabs on everything. So you bookmark place. And then you realize you're seeing stuff from the next that movie. Which Maria asked. Because there's like, like a new place. Yeah. Right. You know, right. And then seasons go, are changing. Yes. It goes on for like <laughs> seven or eight minutes. It kind it's, of rules. It's, it's, <laughs> Kind of a. Ma- I honestly, I'm not being rude here. I almost thought it was the most gripping part of the movie. Same. It's 100 percent the most gripping part of the movie. That which is a huge problem for the movie. Correct. But and we can we can circle back to this and explain it. <laughs> I I watch this thing and I'm just like, you feel like you've almost watched the prequel to a movie that doesn't exist yet, right? I understand that we're watching like part one and he's telling us like, buckle up. This is I'm gonna take my time to spill this out. But you're like, this feels like an entire movie, a backstory. It feels like three hours of watching someone read word for word, cover to cover the instructions to a complicated board game. Yeah. And you're like, so next time we get to play, there are scenes in this that are super gripping. There are character ideas. There are notions. There are images that like got me. But the whole time I'm watching it, I'm like, this is like the thing we need to get out of the way to figure out if he's actually pulling off what he's trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, in theory, like the idea of spacing, giving yourself enough time to explore the fringes, the side characters. Fringes, you talking about their jackets? Mm. Well, it's, watching this movie, I'm like, oh my gosh, there are like people of color in it. Sure. And I'm like, okay, that seems interesting. Oh, we're going to talk about like Chinese immigrants building the railroad. You know, like all this stuff gets like dangled. We're going to see them. And then I think I'm that's like, the Costner's and extent. even yeah. even in terms of the, you know, oh, we're going to spend a lot of time on the the Native American perspective, are we? It's a storyline of five, four more. Mm. How many storylines are so there? So we've got we've got Kevin Costner, Abby Lee. Again, that is not even one of the most important ones, but no, but Sam also, Worth- like this is the thing. There are like fragments of them where yeah. it's like so are Anne Urano and Jenna Malone are we including that as part of the Costner Abby Lee right. thread, but they have multiple scenes that don't right. engage. And they, they have they have separated. Right. Sienna Miller and her daughter are connected to the Worthington and Rooker Here's the and story. Houston also, of it. They also are connected to the Apache Tatanka means. Right. Like so, each, so it's like each sort of. There are like five main story groups, let's say. And within those groups, there are multiple strands, and none of them intersect with each other. Well, but some do. But like, so, okay, you have, there are really three main storylines, which are the settlers led by Sienna Miller, et cetera. And they are attacked by uh, Apaches, and Sam Worthington eventually shows Calvary up comes to pick in. up the yeah, pieces. Sure. There is Jenna Malone who has a baby, runs away from Wyoming, is chased by her husband. Well, I think it's the your... guy she's having an affair with. Like, I thought she was the mistress. Possibly. She I think kills, you're right. Yeah, yeah, she kills the man 
who, who she has a child with. But who it seems like was sort of essentially abusing her. Correct. But I don't think that he dies. And he doesn't no, die. No, he doesn't die. And she tries die. to kill him. They she shoots implied him. that their father was abusive? Or did I misunderstand? That's their father. That's, that's, that's their father. The psych, he's the Sykes patriot. So there's like the right, Sykes and, and family. And their, their sons go after her. Yeah, the and like, then, yeah. And then Abby Lee and Kevin Costner get mixed up into that plot. So like, is Dale Dickey his wife? Yes. Okay, and Jenna Malone is the mistress. Right. Okay. And, and the bad boys are John Beavers and uh, fucking... Jamie Campbell Bauer. Right. Who's pretty, having a good time. Yeah. They're both having a good time, honestly. Yeah, John I Beavers, who I spent 20, 25 minutes being like, Padalecki put on some weight. Like, I, this guy I, looks I, rough I, I thought cool. it was Padalecki, too. It looks so much like Jerry Padalecki just kind of, like, hit a What gym. is it with this movie and, like, CW stars? I don't know, man. <laughs> And then the third storyline, my favorite storyline is, there's also randomly a wagon train, we assume, kind of heading towards Horizon. Luke Wilson is there. He's stressed out. There's some low lives. There's some priggish, you know, rich the, people. The entire movie could have been this for me. Yeah. Sure. I, and was, then I was most into that There's sort of a too. floating fourth storyline that I actually struggled to keep track of, which is Jeff Fahey and his band of, like, scalp hunters. Right. Who kind of emerge out of the first storyline, right? right? And, and now yeah. they're kind of just going off on their own this by the end. The prologue. I mean, this movie Forget literally... the prologue. Let's not even talk about that right now. We have to but talk about boy... that later. <laughs> I can't, it's too stressful. But also, like, where where is the Native American story? Well, this is when I like, got I'm excited. saying that's, a, you, you would say that's sort of part of po plot one, but it really, to me, is its own thing. Right, but Because there's complicated politics within so that storyline. That's line. four. Like yeah, the, so I would really say four to five. I just want, the prologue thing, right? This and movie then there's literally a starts with a stake being driven into the ground, right? Like a planter, like yeah. here's the new town. On this top of a bunch of crawling ants. Like, this is horizon, metaphor alert. <laughs> and here's where it will be. Somewhere in Arizona. Right. This sort and of bookish man and his child sort of mapping out the land, measuring and building out. Everything's going to converge correct. on this. This is where we're ultimately heading. And then you cut to two Apache children on a mountaintop, on a, yes. on a cliffside, let's say. Yes. And they're, they're sort watching. of like, what are these guys doing? And they're like, they're setting out their land. And they're like, what do you mean? It's not their land. What does this mean? Putting a stake in the ground. And I'm like, this is interesting. Yeah. It is. Yeah. This I'm, is why this movie I'm is interesting. by the movie at the beginning where I'm like, Dude. is Kevin about to pull this off? Because here's the whole fucking back and forth I want, which is the idea of like this whole formation of a town thing. Who owns the land? And you were like, what is this? This is all conceptual. This is people saying it's he my might, land because I'm telling you it's my land. He might still pull this off. And, and he then might. we introduce this character of like a priest. Yes. Yes. Who happens upon the decomposing body of the father and son. Yes. That, yeah, that who we, is Angus McFadden? Yes. yes. McFadden. Great actor. Great actor. Right. And we, you know, I was like, oh, it's dark. It's, you know, this is crazy. And then. And then. The movie keeps going. Well. Th then we basically are like years later, this settlement has begun to flourish and there is an Apache raid led by like sort of a section of a pet. Like we later learn like this is sort of like a politically unstable thing. Yes, right? This like, is like the bad, the bad actors. Right. These people are more like, we need to just take this out. We need to clear this out, like rather than let it encroach. It and there are other Tonka people who are like, you're only going to bring headed son. Right. You're right. only going to bring. No, Tonka means no, is kind he, of in the middle. But that, yeah, uh, has... it's Owen Crowe oh, who oh, plays sure. Beyonce, yes. who's yes. the one who's like, Sorry. I'm going to get yes. out there and get yes. those guys. But they have genuine motivation, which is that do. their food source yes. right. is being, being fucked uh, disrupted yes. by the this settlement. Mm -hmm. And the chief is basically like, look, if you, we doing this will bring, you know, the essentially the army, the government, you know, the like the, white the, eyes, they call them. Correct. Like the, the really, you know, bring, bring stuff upon us that we are not ready to deal with. But Beyonce but, is like, no, I'm, we have to do build it. Build the whole movie out of this. I'm watching means, this and I'm like... But, I could watch 12 hours. Yeah, but Griffin, this is what Costner is thinking. I know. Because you just said that about the wagon train, and I kind of agree with you on that, See, too. I, There's a lot of things you could build I movies out of here. I all of these storylines are interesting. I yes. like the Worthington, uh, like Sienna Miller storyline. That's actually my favorite. It. Yeah, I, I think, think he's hot. Solid, I think their relationship, I'm like, wait, I want to see this. It's nice seeing, it's nice seeing old she, potato head. I think she head. got over her dead husband real fast. I'd get over that guy. Who, who sucks? Who cares? I don't know. He doesn't even get a character he poster. Seemed, he seemed brave. <laughs> <laughs> there are like 40 of those. They're I giving those things like, away. As Costner would tell you, hey, back down. You had to get over husbands quickly. Yeah. Costner might be coming around the corner <laughs> and he's sleepy. I don't know. I mean, the whole time I'm watching, I have dances with wolves in my, the back of my head and the whole thing about like Mary McDonald needs to like, be approved that she has done mourning her d dead partner mm -hmm. or whatever. Sure. 
to be able to fuck Kevin. Different Costner. culture. Americans are we're yeah, we're not we're that classy. Tossing people overboard yeah. and fucking planting yeah. sticks right. where they don't belong. Horizon and American Saga, <laughs> <laughs> chapter one. Uh, we can. I'll get back to Dusty in a second, but just to complete the sort of, for, you know, it's like like you said, there's this prologue and then this kind of like prologue part two with the priest, and then we're in this settlement, and I'm like, oh, okay, we're here. All right, I guess the movie has started, and then it is an incredibly long and devastating sequence of like battle that you're kind of like, this is just gonna keep going. Yes, keep going. And you see insane shit like this family gathering and like blowing up their tent. Like, you know, like uh, obviously like Sienna Miller, like barricading and like, you know, running into this well, tunnel with her daughters and like going from crazy. the perspective of the white people, this is yes. shot like it's the strangers, right? I think it's very well done. It's scary. But most of these sequences are like home invasion sequences. It's that sort of language of that kind of horror okay, movie. What I love is that when Sam Worthington shows up, like afterwards, he's like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. It's not your land. We can't protect you Some here. You've gone so you far land that beyond. He didn't own. Right. Like you can't just be here. Like we'll try to help you get out, you know, to safety. But like, I like that Costner immediately gives us the, you know, the people who are furthest West in the American government, right? The people in the forts that are all in the Midwest and stuff are just like, this is way further than we are. And you can't like, yeah, you can't just assume that you can fucking put a tent yeah. here and be like, I own it now. And it also introduces this thread that we get some payoff at the ending of these mysterious flyers that right. are Which showing Rippy up. Right, Rabisi, obviously, searching for <laughs> an obtainium. <laughs> the twist of the <laughs> We assume it's Rabisi, right? Because we see in the trailer. Well, right. It's right. montage. Rabisi. They're building up the intensity of everything that's to come. And the camera's pushing in on the back of a man looking out a window. And you realize these flyers you've been seeing the whole movie that are driving all our characters, we assume, nine hours from now will all arrive in Horizon and all the plot threads will meet. The man who's been building the flyers, who's been printing them at his own printing press, is Giovanni Rabisi. And I turned to Christ Marie and went, he's the Thanos. Yes. And I hate to just use the same six <laughs> pop culture references over and over again, but Costner drops it with this intensity yes. of, I bet you wonder where the flyers are coming from. Yeah. And Rabisi looking out the window has the intensity of him being like, I'm five infinity stones away yeah. from my he's gauntlet. He's like the mastermind. And it's he's very clearly in an urban setting somewhere. He's not out there in the no. West. So I'm like, okay. He's kind of driving people out there. Right. He's a classic Western intellectual villain. Pop, yeah, right. which I'm like, ooh, I love this. And I'm immediately like, I've been wrestling with this movie the whole time. I get to that reveal and I'm like, God, I'm excited to see chapter yeah. two. What if he's kind and of, I'm like, what if he's not even in until chapter three? <laughs> yeah, I don't it. know. No, because they, they filmed chapter two. And he's in And it. he's filmed parts of three. He started three, although it seems like Very he's kind of doing it with his own money. And yes. so, like, who knows what that and means? He's doing a kind of eraser head style piecemeal over weekends. He started his press tour for this movie, and he was rocking the mustache and the weird haircut of Hayes Ellison. And I was like, oh, clearly he must truly be filming chapter three right now. And you get to the banana shake video, and he looks like classic Kevin Costner. And I'm like, you're saying you're filming this now, but you've been doing 18 interviews an hour for the last two months, and you God don't look him. like your character. When he wants to sell a movie, he doesn't half ass it. He is trying. Well, out he's here. been like going to like small markets and like yeah. appearing on like local. He's been doing new everything. <laughs> and he's like been going full PT Barnum, like my yeah. circus is coming to your town. Except it's like PT Barnum who fucks, which I guess is what The Greatest Showman was. But uh, anyway. Kevin Costner, I just want to give you this quote. I'm going back to the dossier a little bit. I realized the content was four movies. It's like when I did Hatfields and McCoys. They thought it was two nights. I said it was four. If you like every scene that was written in, that, in Hatfields and McCoys, and I'm saying this to the executive at the time, then it's four nights. Well, we only do two nights. And I said, it's only going to be two nights. I'm not going to be able to be in it because I'm not going to have all these scenes edited because they'll go away. Kevin Costner... He's like, it's like he, inside out or something. He's like, what if, if you don't shoot the scenes, they vanish <laughs> and then they're dead. <laughs> Why would you just make one horizon when you could put all of the stories into four horizons? 
I saw him on the Rich Eisen show, my secret favorite. You talk love the show. Rich Eisen show, despite not so liking sports. I know. <laughs> I agree with you that Rich Eisen is a good professional interviewer. Yeah, Rich Eisen's kind of my were you, guy. Were you Bill familiar Simmons. with Rich Eisen from the I Love the Decades? Oh, well, I'm sure that endeared me to him. But also, you have to remember that my entire childhood was fighting every day, every morning, every night for control of the television. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And James just wanted my brother James. He just wanted to watch Sports Center. And I very early on was like, Rich Eisen and Stuart Scott are fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, they, if they are on SportsCenter, mm-hmm. I'm Stuart like Scott. 5% engaged with what's happening because these two guys I find funny and charismatic. Uh, so I always, I think, had an affinity for him. I Love the A's probably just intensified that. I really like when he has uh, movie stars on his show. Because he likes movies. He's a big movie fan. Right. He actually cares. Yes. Uh but he, Eisen said, like, I've heard you say that you don't think you're a very good director to Costner and for how bullheaded Costner is. And Costner was like, look, like, you know, I mean, it's just like not my primary identity. And Eisen was like, but you won Best Director. You beat Goodfellas. And he was like, there's no doubt that like Scorsese knows how to use his camera better than I do. I think my primary function as a director is I know story. I know drama. I know character. I know what I want these stories to be. He did say, I'm TNT. I'm also <laughs> very is. funny. TBS. He is. he is TNT. Yes. <laughs> He's basic cable. <laughs> like, that's, he is basic cable. But he presented it as, like, I think my main value as a director and why I choose to direct movies sometimes is, like, as a wedge to use my power as a movie star to make sure no one stops the way I think the story needs to be told. And it always breaks down into this shit with him where he's just, like, you need these 20% of scenes that everyone else would cut. You need the length. You need the runtime. It is very weird watching this movie that feels like it's all sort of like appendix backstory information. Yeah. It's a three-hour film that's the first of four that also feels kind of rushed at times. Like, at it times. moves really fast where that's you're what's like... That's jarring yeah. about it. It's not the, like there's you, a quote in the dossier where he's like, I really wanted to be deliberate and not rush the introduction. Like, the, and it's I'm like, sort of true and it isn't. Or there's action, at least, where you're like, wow, this is happening. Okay. I think this is the argument we made for Open Range in our episode. And I said this to Maria as I was telling her on why I think she'll like Open Range a lot. That's a very simple story that could be told in 85 minutes. And the extra hour that Costner is fighting for there is all just letting you live in the details, the character moments, the death, the specificity. Somehow you're watching Horizon and he's like saying, like, I need 12 hours to tell the story. And you're going, did you actually need 20? Right. Or did you write a 20 hour story that you're now scrunching into 12? Look, my hope is that Horizon Part 2, which has been made in 20 hours, is kind of a season of television. Can I just ask a really quick question about that? Uh, Reviewers at Cannes saw both? They just saw part one. They just saw part one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they no one's this. seen... No one has seen no. part two. I mean, I assume oh. somebody's seen it, but not me. And not critics. And yeah, not okay. Really no, they just screened that part one. That seems stupid to Right, because he's saying... I think it's all they had done. He's saying, hopefully I'm back at Cam with part three. He's presenting a universe in which part one and part two come out one summer, part two, part three and part four come out one so summer. They, o- they only, they only yes. screened part this one? This is exactly what they saw. You can't... Okay, no, mm. I just feel like you Marie, this is what they released in I know, theaters. But I feel like you can't like I I it just feels like so clearly part of a whole. Yes. It does. And more so than any other movie I've ever seen. Of correct. The, correct. Yes, that is why this movie's weird. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What you just said is true. Sorry, and Ben. I'm excited to go back. That's the will, thing. Will I you go too. at 10 p.m. though? Never again. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna have to make Later. a point. We're gonna have to really have someone's to gonna have to sacrifice. We're gonna have to do it together. No, we have to do it together. Costner does fund the movie himself a little bit. Uh, he does get a couple of mysterious financial backers to put up friend. some money. Yeah, Saudi uh, look, I, I, people. I just remember Tim Simons, dear friend of the show, world's greatest texter, <laughs> during the filming of Draft Day, being like, he has a lot more money than we realize. He has a lot of money. There was just this feeling of not just like, oh, clearly he has a lot of money. He's a movie star who is very films. successful. <laughs> no. There was just always this vibe where he would invoke certain things where it's like, he clearly invested his money well, saved it well, put it into certain things, where just assets would get referenced sometimes. And it also just feels like he like runs in very wealthy circles. It doesn't feel like he has movie friends that much. You never hear about like, 
Because he's not in Hollywood. He hangs out in Montana and Wyoming or whatever. Like, you know, that's where he is. Right. And they're just sort of quiet billionaires that I think he's friends with who he got to pitch in. And he put up apparently a couple of, quote unquote, Middle Eastern businessmen Uh also put some money in. I don't know. Uh, I'd love to see those meetings, though. Costs are being like the rise. The most interesting thing about this movie is that he does own it outright. And so much of his argument, there's obviously been an immediate doomsday of like this movie's opening weekend was bad. He Such kept bullshit. Right. Uh, but he this is what he's always said. And I do think he's right yeah. about this. He's like people view the cost of a movie as a bet on the opening weekend. It's an asset. It has a life of its own. If you make this thing correctly, it lives forever. And it's like in his mind, whatever version of this movie, whatever version demands, uh, you know, how many parts he actually completes. This is a movie he gets to like resell every three years. Yeah, look, beyond that, I mean, I sell it again to streaming services and to television on DVD and whatever it is like these contracts will just renew the reaction to. Like the box office of Horizon has is just so demonstrative of how poorly the trades can handle box office reporting at this point where they're like the hundred million dollar movie open to 11, like small. And I'm like, was it hundred? The film cost a hundred mil for two, not one. Fifty million dollars can be your number for one part. Number two. Like, he owns the movie outright. No one is, like, this is a passion project. This is not some Warner Brothers, like, stock raiser, right? You know what I mean? Like, so upfront that he's like, I didn't do this as a bet to get rich. It was driving me crazy not making this movie. And I do think there is, especially guys like him and Coppola, and I even would put, like, fucking Seinfeld's Unfrosted and some of these weird passion projects made by incredibly rich, incredibly famous old men. Right, I who do, have no reason to, you know, put anything on the line. Why right? risk like, it? Yeah, and exactly. what's fascinating is them making these weird misshapen things. And you're like, you thought this would be commercial? And it's like, no, these guys didn't think this would be commercial. Seinfeld got Netflix to give him money and probably laughed all the way to the bank. But I do think there is a commonality that I don't see being discussed. And I'll hear it in other areas of, like, the arts world. But guys of a certain age who I think during the pandemic were like, what if I never got to make anything ever again? Yeah, that's probably driving it a little bit. Right. What is the thing I've been too scared to bet on or that always feels a little out of reach or I'm not ready for? And I think we're seeing now when it's like, why is there all this energy in the air of these guys who could be retired instead taking their biggest swings? And I do think it's all these guys were just like. Well, if I die tomorrow, what's my regret in my career? Eddie, Eddie Murphy talks about that Eddie in Murphy? that profile yes. in the Times. Right? What a His normal guy that is. Super normal. Love what was it called? Like soul, 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 soul. But then soul, no, soul, soul, soul. But that is crazy because that's him saying, I cut professionally yeah. a trailer for a fake movie, but a movie that I'd like to make someday. Everyone who sees it, including David Marchese, who is like, wait, you should make this. Like, this is really funny and this is so perfect for you. And he's like, yeah, I don't know if everyone would like it, though. Like, that's his reaction. But then in that same interview, he's like, how much do you think about your audience? He's like, I don't serve the audience at all. I don't care. I do whatever I he think is funny. He like six he's different contradictory liar. things. <laughs> he's he's like, fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> he's obviously intelligent. He has made amazing movies. I uh, hear this new one is good, which is great news. But that interview is so telling of, like, what a weird funhouse mirror his brain is. But look, th- these... And Costner. then moments like when Marchese is like, Bowfinger is one of your best works. He's like, anyone could have done Bowfinger. And it's like, yeah, like, absolutely not. No, dude. <laughs> like, like, no one could. I, I was the only person who could have done the, all of those clumps. Marchese like, quotes God, back to that him. Jerk. That's so much His harder. comedians and cars getting coffee where he's like, fundamental at the end of the day, I'm a comedian. That's my primary identity. Right. And Murphy's like, what? I'm not a comedian. I've done stand up in years. I do. <laughs> and then he's like, then what are you? And he's like, a very sensitive artist. And he's like, why do you think your sus- sus- career has sustained? He's like, because I'm very funny. All all the time. <laughs> but this is, I mean. He also says Pluto Nash is the only bad movie he ever did. Right, well, earlier he says he's had a handful of flops. And then he, when he's litigating, he's like. He's Pluto like, Nash is really the only piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> like he start, it's true, He does start kind of like differentiate. And you're like, Eddie, Pluto Nash might not even be one of your five worst movies. Like. I've still never seen it. Like, but yeah. like there's so much competition. But here is the point. This is yes. why we're not going off subject here. Right. Costner and Eddie experienced a similar level of fame, a similar level of you control Hollywood. You can do anything. Everyone is begging you for your attention, for your time to like sprinkle a little bit of your magic dust on everything. Right. 
I do think that fundamentally warps people's brains. I think you cannot hit the absolute top of the mountain and like come back down to normal altitude ever again. Even if your star wanes, even if your status changes, the perception around you changes, if you make it to the top, it does kind of like rewire you. And you watch both of these guys and the way they talk about themselves and their career and what they want to do and who they aren't. You start to build these like weird walls around yourself. And a lot of Eddie Murphy is clearly him protecting his like very apparent vulnerability, right? He's a sensitive guy, definitely. As he says. No question. Yes. And Costner has just always been like, I just have to like true north, know exactly who I am and not listen to anybody. That's how I last for decades. There was an interesting comment on our Reddit um, about Yellowstone. It's like the perception of Costner's relationship to Yellowstone. People assuming that Horizon would be a big hit because his audience would roll out. Right. But that actually Taylor Sheridan and the Yellowstone Enterprise saved Costner. Yeah, I, I saw that post. I did not totally agree with it. I think it raises some interesting points. I think it is true that uh, it, people like us who talk about Yellowstone and people in the industry who talk about the Yellowstone phenomenon largely do not watch yeah. Yellowstone. I've watched Yellowstone. Like, it's, isn't it just how like much Yellowstone have you but like, Not much because it was awful. Okay, so... <laughs> it, my mom I just, watched I think the, Costner like, was crucial to that movie, ha that show, having a, a big footprint. Landing with prestige. Yes. And as the show has gone on, he's become less and less central to the Correct. show in terms of the narrative. Right. The, the ensemble's and got larger. And Sheridan has built out this Empire spinoffs and all right. that. Yes. But he's right. Is and what if Sylvester Stallone ran a bar? Let's talk about it. Right. Stuff like that. He's playing rancher Logan Roy. It is not him playing classic Kevin Costner. Right. It's like cowboy Dallas. archetype. It's very Dallas. -y. Right. Yes. He's JR. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I agree. There's there's not a straight line between them. And and Chris Ryan was saying the big picture episode, like there is this version of Costner being strategic that is like stay on Yellowstone. Every one season of Yellowstone you do further could basically fund another horizon. Possibly. Sure. Right? Like right. space them out, this and that. I get where he's coming from. Not that we need to give a ton of fucking time to the whole like Costner Yellowstone fallout. Right. But it is like no one should ever make a TV show shit that I think got fucked up even further than the pandemic where and 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 the the Sheridan Empire expanding. And now he's running like 20 shows and he claims he writes every single episode himself. And they were just like they kept saying, hey, you're on hold. We're going to film the next season in four months. And then they get to four months and they would go, we're going to push it back another six months. And Costner's like, I'm sitting around, I'm doing nothing, I'm nearing 70, I have to fucking make this. That is so much, the big thing in his press tour for this, it's part of it is, yeah, a lot of money. I'm spending a lot of money, I can't deny it. And the other part is like, I had to do this. I was running out of time. And there's this line he has about like, I saw my son. And I was like, I have to make this. He's 13 He's now. Gonna I be wanted to it. play the 13-year-old. Exactly. I, I knew right. his son was in the movie, but I had never seen a picture of him before. You clocked him immediately. And yeah, that's one one face I knew. I was like, oh, that's definitely Lil Costner, isn't it? Yeah. it can I guess? Because I, I don't think I know. But you didn't get it, a character post. Is it the boy who rides the, the horses and gets away? No, it's Santa Miller's son. Oh, wow. Yep. Okay. Yep. And if you if you Google Kevin Nathaniel Costner Kittredge. high school, and it kind of looks, it looks yeah. just like him. Yeah, yeah. There's so many Kittredges because there's well, Kit Kittredge in American Girl. Doll. Exactly, right. and then there's so there's well, Sienna. yeah. Apparently, Orphan is a sorry. I, I keep referring to Isabel Furman as Orphan. Of course, she is Orphan because she's Orphan. But, but her yeah, last name is Kittredge, as is Will Patton's. So it's like there's Kittredges everywhere. Yeah you know, coming towards each other. This is a movie that could use, uh, that's a future episode, but a Lynch's Dune style glossary pamphlet Seven in theater. Standing, or a pamphlet, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And not, not to just repeat everything Big Picture said, and usually I'm against things that are this didactic, but like they made the argument, does this movie need like fucking Game of Thrones map transitions? There's so many action movies we watch where you cut to the Eiffel Tower and then a Chiron says Paris, France, and you're like, yeah, I'm not a fucking idiot. You don't need to tell me we're in Paris, France now. When the line before this was, we're going to Paris, and the first line after you're in Paris was, so this is Paris. But this is a movie where I could use a greater visual sort of like template for letting me know where characters are in time and, and space 
Because every time they're just sort of like this region this year, I'm like, I can't remember where we were before. This. I'm I'm so respectful of the movie going experience. Much like Kevin Costner. I am. Yes. Um, and, and Ben Hosley, of course. Taking I think, pictures of the screen. you know, the only uh, I yes, I did have my phone open during Skin and Marank because I like had trouble. Well, you were also you, hiding in a. I was in, hiding in, in, in my coat. jacket. You told us you were inside your coat. Yes. Right. But I had to open fucking Wikipedia. You were during this movie yeah. to keep track of who everyone was. Right. You I was have just I was trying to lives. raw dog it like the world's <laughs> bravest airplane. <laughs> My friend Kate wrote that story. (laughs) And when she told me about it, I was like, that is everyone is going to be talking about. So it is the ultimate (laughs) are men okay story. What is this? We try for my other job. We tried to do our own thing with that. And uh, we were really proud of our post and it got taken down by PR. Uh, I can't be raw dog and nothing on official social media sites. (laughs) I'll say this. Like I went into I was like, I got to commit to just trying to engage with this thing just as what it is. It had helped me that you and a lot of other people I know had told me, hey, this thing is like shapeless. It's him throwing a bunch of shit at you. It has no ending. (laughs) Threads are like picked up and dropped in seemingly like absolutely chaotic order. So I was not trying to wrestle my understanding of this movie to fit into how I normally yes perceive uh, stories that are told visually to you yes in a theater but it is a where you know who is who and what is what we we introduced a screening of cloud atlas yeah, recently I was to bring that up. a film i had not seen on the big screen since it came out it was my third time seeing the movie period marie you saw it for the first time i feel like you had the reaction most people have to cloud atlas the first time which is like <laughs> but i do think that movie very skillfully even just from the beginning interweaves the plots where when you're moving between six very different storylines directed by three different people in two different combinations with different styles and different sensibilities, it does from the beginning make you feel like they're all in the same movie. But it, they also have the advantage of having very different visual languages yes. Yes. so you know where you are. Totally. They do. And also they do this interesting thing that you guys might not have picked up on, which is they use the same actors in every storyline, but they, they're subtle. wearing makeup and stuff. Yes. It is subtle. Right. Like Tom Hanks actually plays the gangster who throws someone off. I don't know if you noticed that was Tom Hanks. The the Irish guy? He's but not it doesn't Irish. feel like <laughs> what is he? He's like a the cockney gangster. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't feel like there's a schematic like we go story one, story two, story three, through to six, and then back to no, one. Okay, and so the book I is organized four. in a specific think, order. I think Sienna Miller could have played Jamie Campbell Bauer. Could have played Hayes. We could play both people I'm in the kidding. shootout. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, we're doing we're a Cloud doing Atlas. A cloud. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm kidding. Kidding. Cloud Atlas will like cut between them. It'll keep you in one story for a while, go back to another one, but it'll also have these moments where they're sort of shaking hands and you're seeing the echoes. Obviously, that's textually part of Cloud Atlas as a story. Beautifully done. But right. as Marie says, of course, it, right, it does have the advantage of all the stories look different. I'm not saying right. you should have done it. It's just because that's another film with multiple threads that I saw recently at an epic length. Kevin Costner. He doesn't do that. He just like, and he doesn't break them into totally isolated segments, but the the stories aren't really commenting on each other. He's just setting up things in motion, right? Well, are they? I don't know. I'm like trying to think because like in Cloud Atlas, it's like, okay, there's there's like a different archetypes in each plot line, but I guess it's not. It's like yeah, but the, the, Cloud Atlas does those montages where it's like sort of here are characters at similar moments. Yes. There's a lot of emotional arcing yes. at the right. same time. But I don't think that. that's ha- there. No, they're, none of this is happening yes. in Horizon. No, I'm Here's saying, a great I'm quote from Kevin Horizon Costner. Horizon does none of Kevin that. Costner. Why did he direct the film? Why not let someone else do it? He's never meddled with a director, for example. Might be a great choice by him. But Kevin Costner can protect the little stuff, guys. Right. This is his argument on the Rich Eyes, I'm sure. Uh, I felt like this movie has a tone and it has to be maintained. I don't know that I could have lived with myself if I saw scenes where a female character is bathing and someone said, we need to cut that out because women's desire to be clean and keep their families clean was utmost. Well, Kevin, that's, that that's why the, he included the, okay. that. Okay. The is, sensuality or just a plain idea of can I get this dirt off me turned into a sensual moment in the film until it was busted by a voyeuristic situation and we suddenly saw the scene for what it was, which is that they ruined it. I, that Him is the talking wildest. is a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. That's also the <laughs> wildest example he could choose. Women want to be clean in all times. Marie, can you confirm? Women be clean. Uh, yeah, that women's desire to be clean and keep their families clean was utmost. Marie, you don't have to answer this question. <laughs> it's so crazy that he's just like, they tried to cut the peeping Tom scene, but I'm here to protect it. I, Kevin Costner, director of well, film. Like his, his, 
And that scene is actually really interesting. I yeah. think it's interesting for yes. the menace that it presents, yes. but not for the first part of it. What do you mean? It's That seems clearly until the menace about women's desire to keep themselves <laughs> clean throughout history or whatever. Yes. That scene actually rocks. I don't know. The other women in this movie are dirty as hell. That Isabel Furman especially. Love, yeah. Loving the her look. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but that scene rocks not not the uh, peeping tom scene itself, but the Luke Wilson confronting them scene, thing. where They're you're like, like, "This has juice." Like I this is it crazy. Reminded you of how hard it is, and it's you're dirty yes. and it's yes. hot. You're on a and fucking you, wagon and train. You, and you well, stink. I think the conservation of water, like this, is always this is something that's really really interesting. But like he already introduces the con the conservation of water. Mm -hmm part with when she takes the cup of water and, and the and treats it like you know. it's a water delivery service. Right. So it's like we already get that. So I mean, I don't know. I, I think like that sequence, especially all the fallout of it, Luke Wilson. Come on, man. Right. This is annoying for me. Uh, Costner shootout with Jane B. Campbell Bauer. The raid at the beginning of the film we're talking about, right? You missed like, this part, but I liked the scene when Sienna Miller squashes some scorpions with a boot. That was fun. I think I, I did see that. Um, no, you were th away There's also it. the big I shootout. Just some other squashing. Them. She's always squashing. Yeah. Uh, there's a you know, women have been squashing throughout. Women history. be squashing. <laughs> <laughs> women be since, bathing. Since women, women be stood squashing. up right, they have squashed to protect their families. Griffin, you missed it. They invent squashing. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and she changes her name to Lady Squash. It's crazy. Uh, there's also the big crazy uh, like horseback battle in the end with Jeff A and all that. That's that they largely cut away from, and you watch the boy watching it. It's kind of a cool. Oh, oh but the the sort of uh, uh, pressure cooker standoff in the general the store? general store. Yeah, that that like, scene was really intense. The four sequences in the movie that are undeniably gripping are the ones that are most conventionally playing by the Western playbook. They are scenes that feel like they could come out of any Western. It's your classic two guys squint at each other and the tension builds and is it going to boil over or not? What's a little interesting is that in two of the big cases, he avoids the conflict. It does feel like he's letting it simmer. But like in those moments, the movie is fucking cooking with gas. And that's not him dissecting the Western and the mythology. That's not him getting into the types of scenes that movies wouldn't have time to cover. It's him hitting the big scenes. He hits the big scenes well, but I was often intrigued by smaller scenes like the Luke Wilson confrontation, like the conversation between uh, Tatanka Means and his, you know, the chief. Like, you know, like you know, there's even the Jenna Malone stuff, which was the most Twin Peaks, the return coded stuff. I did say, refer to that in my review. I, you've seen Twin Peaks, the return. Nope. Okay. Nobody's seen it. Okay. Well, we'll all we'll be watching. We'll be watching, we'll be watching around it. the time I'm this drops. I'm making my way hopes. through season well, two. Twin Peaks: of The Twin Return, Peaks which David Lynch undeniably did basically make as like one big giant thing that he then like cut into pieces, mm -hmm. does kind of have this quality where it's suddenly you're just cutting to an entirely new thing that's not seemingly connected to anything. Sure. With a Luke Wilson type actor mm -hmm. that you recognize. Yeah. And. It's jarring and it puts you out of place and is kind of cool in Twin Peaks, often very cool. In Horizon, maybe often more just jarring, but the experience is interesting and unusual, right? Why am I watching Luke Wilson right now? Oh, he wasn't it. here before. Yes. And now is he important? It's two hours in. Is this a cameo? And then or is like, this guy someone I'm going to spend time with over the next couple of years of these movies getting released? In Cloud Atlas, say, it's like, well, I'm like, oh, I know this is going to kind of relate to another story somehow. They all have handshakes. In Horizon, I'm like, all I know is they generally are kind of going to Horizon. That's the only but thing really linking these. Where you're like, is he doing something that's almost abstract or is this just sloppiness? That's why yeah. it uh, always you will wrestle within me, Horizon in American Saga <laughs> Chapter 1. Like the Michael Anagaro, is that how you say his name? Angarano and Jenna Malone and, you know, like yeah. that whole sequence. It's suddenly out of nowhere. He's like, well, gentlemen, if I could just sell you my house. And they're like, we mean to shoot you. And he's like, well scuttle that and here's the documents like he's not even listening to them it's such a weird funny scene it's so also dark like the cult of late clint as well where you're like is this so traditional that it becomes transgressive or are we projecting something onto this so that's a good call on late clint traditionalism clint is really good at setting out an an idea yes and communicating it really Those simply and effectively right and like sometimes the idea is perhaps that choo choo what happened here? There was a railroad and it went right through somebody. Yes. 
But he also, I think, is just better at, like, I, I, this movie, even though we're talking about little scenes, I'm not really getting as much of the texture. Clint Eastwood is a better director than and yeah. No question. I, no, no, no. You know, I, I, I agree with you, and I think, like... But I know what Griffin means about, like, you're engaging with something that's so traditional or straightforward or whatever that you right. do. Is it but a horseshoe theory? Also, it's gotten so complicated that, yes, yeah. it's horseshoe all the way around where I look at this and I'm like, it's insane that he's not building this in a way where the pieces add up to something greater. And you... I maybe seems, they will. But, well, right. So there's the part of it which is like, is it too soon to say, which then makes it impossible to talk about this movie in the present moment. But I see people arguing like, this thing's either just like a drafts folder that he's just relaying to me in some chaotic order or... There is something daring in him not choosing to spoon feed it to you in a way. And then it's like, are we now narrativizing what is in fact? I am so jealous of the listeners who will get to, because these are coming up back to back, right? Yeah. 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 Get right. to listen to this as, because oh, all our trap now fucking breaking this up. No, it's not. We're oh, okay. having them back okay. to back. Great. No, because trap moved up. It actually made it easier. Yes. No. Next week is going to be fascinating for you folks, and unfortunately, it's five weeks in the future for <laughs> yeah. us. Yes. Um, Horizon and American Saga Chapter One. So, what haven't we talked about here? Um, not, not that I'm saying we're wrapping it up. I'm more um, I like. So we talked I, about the first chunk. So I well, the attack. But just another thing to add on to the attack is I um. My favorite scene in Dances with Wolves that um, obviously it's Buffalo. And that is a scene that I think is just like really you feel you feel the texture of it. And I think the closest he gets to that in this is when they're in the the dirt. We were all a little perplexed by Dances with Wolves. I but mean, I've, I've that's, seen it before. That's obviously. inarguably. Yeah, but I'm saying in that episode, in our yeah. in watching it again for this show. Yeah. Right. I, I think that is the inarguable thing, though, is like that movie has a sweep. It has a style. It has an emotion. But there, it has a detail. Even, yeah, but it's also it's also like an, an experiential moment where you as the viewer are like actually you're feeling what the character is. Feeling. And I thought the claustrophobia and terror of Sienna Miller and her daughter in the little hideout particular the the sh getting the shotgun through the I dirt. was yeah. very that, yeah I thought it was I was like oh man uh, in I, it. I I'm in like, that yeah this is right this is gonna and like that her crawling out of it you know but that was a uh, I was like all right I want more of that but mm -hmm. this goes back to the core thing of for me of like he's made a lot of movies where everyone else is like this is a 90 minute story and he's like no it's a three hour story and then he's allowing you to live in those details versus this feeling like a 20 hour season of television squished down to 12 hours and you're losing those details at times when those details do come up when there is a moment that feels more visceral then i'm like excited but a lot of it i was just sort of like this is all just information he's trying to he's laying so much fucking track and i don't know what's gonna like return the investment or not i i was not bored watching this film no i was a little less engaged than i wish i could have been i wanted to be Fully gripped more often. I let I let go of the rope at times. There are scenes where I'm just kind of like, I okay, you know. And then there are other scenes where I was very engaged, such as like the the, the showdown with Michael Angarano. Like suddenly, I was just like, this is this is a crazy dynamic. And, the, and what is this? The Faye General store scene that happens, general like, store scene two and a half Great. hours movie it, it, into the movie is that the first time we're seeing Faye in the whole film possibly yes i don't know i don't, I don't know. know if he was in, we saw him before they did have that moment in the, <laughs> when they're deciding to like oh some of us are gonna go off and get right, revenge right can, like, we, can we explain that a little bit more i was so confused <sighs> Why? So the kid in that sequence is the kid who rode away, who Ben thought yes. was Costner's so son. So that kid, right? that kid is orphaned by the raid we see in the beginning of the movie, right? And as they are, as the settlers are taking stock of what they've just experienced, and then the uh, the Union Army comes with Michael Rooker and uh, Sam Worthington. They're like, you know, you guys, we're gonna bring you to our outpost where you'll be safe. It's not safe for you here, and you guys were stupid to settle here, but. We're gonna we're gonna move you guys Come on there. back essentially. Like, so, we can't defend you if you decide right. to stay here. We can't right. defend you. 
So a, so the group of settlers splinters. M- the women and children go and they're like, we're yeah, we out. They're like, we're going to be with Sam with Worthington. Worthington. And they, then they, that potato head, they just it's so easy to follow it. <laughs> yeah. How can you not? Exactly. How can you not? The squarest skull. <laughs> as long as exactly as long as the sun's in the sky, the shadow it casts. Uh, and then there's a, a faction of the group, all men, and I guess it's supposed to mirror the faction of the group of the Apache yes, who, the, who are kind of like the let's, raid in the first place. Let's escalate. Like, we're going to escalate. We're going to get revenge on, you know, we're going to avenge our lost family and, and members there, and fellow white people. There's quote-unquote scalp hunting because they're like, we're going to get money for every person we kill. You know, like they're talking about it amongst themselves. There's like and a it's scalp l- currency and they even talk about basically scalp counterfeiting where right. they're like, you find like an Italian no knows, guy, that's Indian dark Indian enough that we... Could be right. some other, you know. Yeah. And I think Costner is trying to show you like how this is building to like all out war, right? Rather than like, maybe there's a way we can all share... No. Like, there's zero honor to it. Well, certainly, it's just on the, disgusting. Uh, on the and settler American and side. Yes, exactly. You see it through the eyes of the young boy who is like, you know, trying a young person trying who's, to be a man, and but also like, what path is he going to go down? Like, is he going to choose violence? Is he going to be turn away from violence? You know, like we see him not shoot the father and son in the general store when given the opportunity. But what, 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 what did the father think was going to happen? That he was going to miss? In that scene, I think no. Why is he the not guy, running for his life? Because the guy whispering to him, who can speak Apache, the translator was like making a judgment that the kid wasn't going to go through with it, that it was going like stand your ground. The kid's not going to do it. So he, the guy, just like guessed that the kid wouldn't shoot. What's interesting wow. about that scene is you're trying to figure out if he's trying to psych out the Apache in order to save his son's life so he can get the first shot. But in reality, I think he was making a correct judgment call. I mean, this is. I swear this is not me just saying it from the fucking vantage point of being like a woke liberal on a mic, but I just feel the narrative imbalance on the perspective in this movie, especially relative to the prologue, where I'm like, well, if this is all about the land, then this is, I want to see more of a back and forth versus it feeling like we are like 80 to 90% settler perspective. 10% 10% like indigenous perspective. Maybe 15 if you want to be right. super generous. And anytime yeah. the movie kind of shadows the two sides, it feels like it's getting at but something. that's what I'm saying about like, right. If there's really three big storylines, they're kind of half of one. And then the other two obviously are so far completely disconnected. Right. And half yes. of one is even being a little generous. Exactly. I'd say it's maybe a fourth of the one. Maybe a Maybe. But the trail storyline could use a counterpoint. Correct. Because there are there are indigenous characters that and are like, introduced. I don't know, maybe we're gonna get to part three and there's gonna be fucking ninety straight minutes. Yeah. Like I don't I know. Which way it. it's, it's, it. it's, it's not how he's setting to, this movie to talk up. About it. Yeah. Right. It's it's also the reason to like fucking make this movie in 2024. Is like this is what they wouldn't have done in the 40s. You know, we we watch Dances with Wolves now and it feels a little like slight on this scale well, paternalistic and but you, you know, read reviews at the time and people were just like there has been no american western that has spent this much time in the perspective of the native yeah, american I, I get why at the time it was picture, seen as revolutionary it was like the important movie it whatever, is weird yeah. that this movie does less than the movie he made 30 plus years ago on that front and i understand he's trying to tell a much broader more expansive story but it does often feel like an afterthought in this a little it I almost wish it was more of an afterthought because then you could just be like, it's just an afterthought. Right, There's he's, just enough and enough interesting performances he's got in there. great actors doing it. Exactly. Yeah. That you're like, ah, there is actually something to this. Right. I want more. And sure, I can hold out hope that chapter four, maybe, you know, like I have no, but like, I don't, I assume that it will stay balanced like this. Another thing he said on the Rich Eisen show. He was talking about how the story went from the one movie script to the four parts, right? Right. And he's like, so what was the central movie and what expanded? What wasn't it originally or wasn't it originally? And he was like, look, when it was one movie, my character Hayes had a line where he mentioned some trouble he got into in the past. Right. Right. And now we're in that. Trouble. Yes. We're halfway through the trouble. Right. So the movie he had originally built around this character that he loved so much, he named his son after him. We're is still later. Like, yes. Prologue territory. Right. 
we haven't even gotten to that starting point. You're like, maybe Abby Lee is just backstory for him, but certainly everything with John Beavers and Jamie Campbell Bauer and like him having to fight off these guys, which seems like it's maybe going to be resolved in the next movie. I told this to David Roth, Mike. I just want to say this to Ben and Marie because it's kind of nice. When I was at CalArts, my very brief tenure at film school, there was a horrible wildfire and they asked everyone to evacuate the campus in the Santa Clarita area. My friend who lived down the hall, Stevens Gaston, who was a drama student, was like, I have a friend who's got an apartment in Hollywood. We can sleep on his floor. And me and two of my friends went there. And the guy whose apartment we were staying at was John Beavers, who was a struggling actor who had gotten no work and was like, I'll take care of you guys. And he was like, can I show you my favorite movie of all time? And he played us his VHS of Fandango. Kevin Costner's Kevin Reynolds first starring role, major film that kind of starts his career, starts the relationship. Tell me this when we saw the movie. I want to say it for the mic so you can have the reaction you're having right now. And he was just like, I've watched this movie 40 times. Costner's so good at this and that. David sees this movie. He's like, there's this guy in it. I don't know. Pop so hard. I thought it was Panalecki, John Beavers. And I was like, fucking John Beavers did it. He got his (laughs) Costner in in a Costner movie. He pops and he's He's good. Fucking Huge. And he's he, big. Yeah. He's, he's a, a great boy. He's a yeah. big, tall guy and always seemed like kind of a sweet, goofy dude. After I knew him very briefly, oh, hung out with him a couple times, oh, no. 20 That's plus years point. ago, he then was on like a Nickelodeon children's show where he was part of the Fresh Beat Band as like a Wiggles type performer. Wow. And I was like, good for John getting work doesn't seem like what he wanted to do, but he's doing it without shame. And now has like transitioned into like, it feels like the exact character actor career he always wanted. Shout out. Yeah. Rules. Made me really happy. And I think he's one of the best uh, performances in the film. Although I think most of the performances are good. Again, you're getting this kind of like report card incomplete, but I like where you're going with this. Now, like, Marie? I didn't love Abby. Oh, well, she's got big saucer eyes. I like Abby. Uh, uh, she's fine. I was more teeing you up for what you said afterwards, which like, it feels like this movie needs movie stars. And I don't know if it's a production value thing. I don't know if it's that it's like. Well, the fact that I like I keep confusing people for people who, who are on CW shows. He's not Nolan. OK, he ago. can't just get everyone. But he can get Sienna Miller. But just and like Sam Worthington. But they are they are just like the most like milk toast like. Dude, what do you expect? This I is a know. self-financed film. I it is don't just know. The part of it that we're, you're like the epic of it. I mean, he loves how the West was won so much and cites it so much as an example. And clearly that kind of multi-part storytelling. Right. How the West was won is essentially is, three movies. Exactly. Right. But yeah, also, exactly. Like, okay. just three sections. I mean, but you're watching that movie and even though the guys don't cross over, you're like, man, this movie has all of the leading men in it. But how the West was won, which is long, overstuffed and stupid, stupid indulgent, I would, is a lot shorter than Horizon yes. and American Saga Chapter One. Correct. It's less than three hours but long. It, it, all right, it's like, yes, movie stars, but m- mostly just like faces. Like I needed like Jamie Campbell Bauer. That's his name, right? Correct. He, he has a face. I think that there were and a lot of good faces. Beavers has a face. Beavers has a face. There's Friggin' so- Rooker, man. Rooker has a face. Wait, so Rooker's like weirdly kind of touching in this movie. I needed to, I needed to, like at least 40 minutes with his wife. This is David's right, oh, though, yeah. that this she is the problem that anything we ding this movie for kind of boils back to I wanted more of that. Right. <laughs> Where you're like, are we proving Kevin Here's right? Here's my hotter take. We've spent years suffering watching pretty good television shows that were clearly movie scripts that got stretched a little far so that they could cover eight episodes on Hulu or whatever, right? Movies have been turned into TV shows for too long. It's time for movies to get their revenge. We're going to have TV shows turn into movies for no good reason, and movies will just have TV qualities to them. This is what I'm fighting against. To confuse and annoy people. a bottle episode about the death of Michael Rooker's child. Uh, What a great performance he's given, Michael Rooker. You you liked that. I just said that. I know. He's having fun. No, but I just, I was just thinking. Rooker with a soft look, a soft eye. He's great. I, for, you know, for my other job, I spent a lot of time rewatching Killers of the Flower Moon. And those are not necessary. There are there's are two movie stars in that movie. Sure, but the faces but are very the distinct. faces are distinctive yes. of yes. every s- s- small character and you can keep track of who's who. Yeah. No, I think I think uh, I'd say for 50 percent of the characters, he succeeds on that front. And for 50 percent of the cast, it tends to be the smaller roles. But in a movie like this, it is disorienting 
if in some of the smaller roles you cannot keep track of, am I meeting this guy for the first time? Jeff Fay, you are not familiar with. No, I He asked, comes this, in over two hours in. I said, who is this Pierce Brosnan looking guy? Right. And I was like, that's fucking Jeff Fay. I'm excited that Jeff Fay is in this movie, but I'm also immediately going, was Jeff Fay in an hour earlier, but was it in a three shot where I didn't get a close enough view at his crystal clear piercing this blue movie eyes? also does like a weird job of like, I recognize someone and then my expectations are that person's going to be a main character. Like with Michael Angarano. And he gets killed off immediately. Right. And that feels Jamie Campbell Bauer. Pointed. Oh, this yeah. is going to be the main antagonist. Gets killed. But I will mean, Patton yes. just kind just of critical. being here? You're yeah, like, is well. this just a favor for Kev? No, he'll be. Is he going to stick around? He'll have some importance yeah. later on. He will, presumably. Series. Yeah. He's also a Kittredge. Uh, it's also just the law for him to be in any movie shot on like, that's like west of the Mississippi. It's like Will Patton has will to Patton's be in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I'm looking at the cast list. It is a lot of faces that I am fine remembering. You're Danny Houston's. You're Jenna Malone's, right? You know, where it's like, yeah, I know who that is. Great. Great to see him. Who's the Chungus <laughs> on the Santa Fe Trail? <laughs> the Chungus on the on the wagon like train? The, the yeah. voyeur? Yeah. I don't who know. Who is that? Oh, yeah. That was, guy I stuck out in my mind. Both of those guys are good. Because the other one... Let me get this right. Because there's, I think there's uh, Charles Holford. I don't know. I know he's one of the, he's the dad. He's the uh, the dad that they shoot. Okay. Is it Tim Gunny? Gwynny? No. That guy? No. No, he's a, he's this a guy, Kittredge Roger well. Ivans. Yes. Roger. He's well, a, I don't even see him in plays, the cast list. He plays blindfolded man in Love Lies Bleeding. Okay. He plays helicopter sniper in Stranger Things. Am I wrong in thinking the younger of the creepy guys, the smaller one, is Douglas Smith, who we were recently shitting on in our Ouija episode? I uh, think yes, he's the is. little peeper. Yeah. yeah. yeah who he I don't, is the little peeper. I just don't love that actor. Although he's, I think he's, he's good in this. I think he's yeah. very oh, effective in he's this. In, he's in vinyl. He's he in, in vinyl, vinyl, which we talk about, I yes. think, and um, he's in Terminator he, or something. He Genesis. Was, is he doing an accent? Are they both not American? Th this is another this thing. This is another thing. I couldn't like, figure out where yeah. they're from. Roger Ivins is the I think the they almost yeah. are like doing Russian, maybe? Right. One of them felt like German and one of them felt Slavic. And yes. I'm like, is that going to get explained? It must. I'm also like, I need I need to know more about the, the British people. Like, is he an illustrator? Like, is this part of like... I, my, you know, he seems like he's an artist. So well, are he they talks about how they're going to print his illustrations? Right. So is he like, you know, like a, a Remington or someone like along to like kind of document what's going on? You know, like I'm just I, these, I, these I are like threads that are right. dropped. And I'm just like, I. I absolutely said this when we did the original episode at the time. But when I went to see Matrix Resolutions with my I'm sorry, Revolutions Resolutions is the next one, the Drew Goddard one. You mean Resurrection. No, I'm joking. I'm making a bad okay. joke after okay. I fucking misspoke. Uh, when I went to see Matrix Reloaded, the second one. The second one. Okay. When it came out and my friends were like, was that disappointing? I remember my take as a 14 year old being that movie just threw a bunch of balls into the air. And I guess the real question is if the third movie is going to catch them. My view on those two movies is different now than it was then, as David has forced into my brain. But I do feel this way with Horizon where I'm like, so many of these details we're talking about. I'm like, man, if, if fucking part two pays some of these things off, if it sees them through, if it digs deeper, if he gets to make three and four, like, does all of this seem better? But I also could just imagine a world in which part two just introduces 80 new things where he just keeps piling stuff on. And this is often the risk of what happens with passion projects that people have live in their mind for decades is they start to go like so deep into their own universe that it no longer becomes like translatable to an audience. It is like the miracle of Fury Road that that works. But when people talk about the people who've seen Megalopolis, it's described in very similar terms to this movie, not for being the same movie, but having the same like this guy's thought about it so deeply that he's worked past the version that makes sense to us. Yeah, and obviously, as much as we love to deride studios and studio notes and all that stuff, we're mostly watching movies that were shaped by that. 
So when there is especially a ostensible blockbuster, mm-hmm. which this sort of is, and yep. Megalopolis prime some will have some semblance of sure. that doesn't have that loose boundary around it, it's going to often feel weird. This movie feels very weird. It's For so a very weird. normie dad movie in many ways, yes. it does feel strange and quote unquote avant-garde. Kind of. I, w- I wish it looked more I agree. I think it would be great if, uh, again, I assume this is economics. As you said to us before we started recording, Marie, this film shot for only 52 days versus 100 plus for yeah, Dances, Dances with, with wolves. wolves. Obviously, it's not shooting on sumptuous, kino, beautiful, you know, grainy film. It yeah. looks fine, I would say. It Digital, looks fine. You know, there, are, fine. there are moments that are very striking. I would say this movie Kinda just looks like TV. not yeah, have a consistent like visual language. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of it feels out of necessity. Like it, there are times where I would just feel like the visual language would change within a certain scene. There are shots that look like it was shot on an iPhone where they're like, we just have to get this quickly. I'm not saying it was literally shot on an iPhone, but like I feel the circumstances in some of the setups. They're on location, but though, right? They yeah, are, and I feel immediate like... Immediate production value. They, right, yeah. they take advantage of that. Just sometimes looked a little flat. Like, the guy who shot this shot open range. Like, it's J. Michael Murrow. Like, it's not like he has incompetent nobodies no, behind no. the camera or whatever. But, you know, just... Uh, give me some, you know, some green. Are there other things we have to say about this movie? Hmm. I mean... T- we kind it's of jumped tough. around with the plot and the, yeah. it already jumps around so yeah. much. I don't really know where we would pick up or where we left off. Do you know that Ella Hunt, who's the uh, the British the, lady, the British bathing lady, is playing Gilda Radner in Jason Reitman's SNL movie? You could see that. Could you? Sure. She's got a face. She's a woman. You are right that Gilda Radner was a human a woman. woman with yes. a face. Yes. I just think I watched this movie, and I'm not saying this was her audition for SNL that she walked in. Hey, my, a cup of water, please. Uh, yeah, it actually sounds like something Gilda Radner might have and fun with. And then Jason Reitman went, you are my Roseanne, Rosanna Dana. It but is it, just kind of funny. It, she came on screen, I turned to Marie, and I, I said that to her. Yeah, and I was like, what? It didn't process. So the, the Costner shootout, leading up to it, oh, I mean, talk the about... The brother hitting yes. the kind guy. Michael, Michael Angarano. Angarano. I'm mad. Yeah, because he's a sweetie and he's yeah. been sucked into something he doesn't really understand. Exactly. And he's so small. <laughs> These he guys really, are so big. I mean, <laughs> next to beavers, he looks like a fucking little Actually, minion. I, he would have. He would have. You would have played that role. Griffin. I would have. Yeah, I would have. I would have played that role. He is kind of the Rick the intern of Horizon. <laughs> yeah. I want all my picks back. The, the Costner just in that scene. But also, I, it, it, I like got... You there, hot cake eating motherfucker. I, what? I, I was asking, again, like in real time, asking you questions when he and Cons, uh, Costner confront each other. This is I'm like, too. Is, is this completely ran? What is, what is Hayes Ellison's backstory? We don't know. We don't Big hat. know. Right. I, this is what, what I... It, what, yes. what is... So my read of what he's getting at here, but you're watching this movie trying to like fill in blanks going like, I guess I'm supposed to infer this. And then certain times you're like, no, I guess I wasn't. I'm supposed to know nothing. I'm supposed to just be reading only what's happening. I guess the idea is that Hayes Ellison is your classic like fucking man with no name. I ride into town. I have yeah. no attachments. Yes. He's and just- he finds himself in this moment accidentally placing himself at the center of a conflict, which ties him to this woman. Making an emotional decision to, to help people while also being like, you know, this is the world's a cruel place, man. We got to get out of here. I can't protect you forever. Blah, blah, blah. I think the moment of greatest like visual triumph in this movie is you're having this pressure cooker. These two guys uh, centering, uh, circling around this. What, what do you call it? A trough? The, oh yes, that's the best. That's the best shot in the movie. And you're you're like a little visually disoriented, and then the camera goes over Jamie Campbell Bower's shoulder, and you see the reaction of Costner in the water shooting. Yeah, him. that was cool, and it's like incredible. I, I mean, I think it's so crystal clear what's happening. No, the no, dynamics I'm say- and I'm saying in a good way. Okay, that he's he's purposely throwing you off a little bit of like these two guys keep moving around. Where are they relative to each other? Who's going to pull the gun first? And you're waiting for your classic, like, it cuts to a close-up of Costner lifting the gun. And instead, you're seeing the shootout happen in a reflection of the other guy's shots. Right, right, right. It somehow captures 
the feeling of being caught unawares rather than needing to telegraph to the audience and here's the impactful moment. Like, it, it, that genuinely made me gasp. Can yeah, that something? was cool. Yes, David. Horizon and American Saga, chapter one. I wanted to say it again. Horizon and American Saga, chapter one. This episode's kind of the opposite of Horizon and American Saga, chapter one, because I keep sweet. checking the clock and being like, what, we've been going for four hours? And we haven't. No. How long have we been recording for? One hour, hour and 40, 40 minutes. Who needs it? Who needs anything Who else? Need I mean, what else is there to talk about? This is the problem. There's so much in this, and yet it's so overwhelming that you end up just talking about it in sort of large, abstract swaths. Or we also are talking like individual scenes we like. We like the characters. I'm excited to see what... I mean, we didn't hear Rabisi talk at all, right? No. So what voice is he going to uh, do? He's going Normal. to make a choice. No. What? You know who else is apparently in Chapter 2? I don't. Thomas Hayden Schroeder. Oh, fuck Yes, yeah. I know, which I'm very excited for. I did okay. know that. Yes. Right. That's cool. Hopefully he's playing sort of the Ronan the Accuser of this universe. I think he is. Yeah, Rabisi's yeah, yeah. the Thanos. <laughs> Who's the guy um, that... Um, I'm sorry, I We're can't doing keep great. track of names. Who's That's the guy okay. that what? Marigold what you... sleeps with? Before, oh, great oh yeah, she sleeps a with. Yes, example okay, of a so, scene where I'm like, I don't understand if I'm supposed right. to Marigold understand. Being Abby Lee's character. And I asked Griffin, like, is she fucking turning tricks? Like, that was my like, read. But who's this guy? Out, like, what the hell is going said, on? I think he's a John, and then he starts referring to their backstory yeah. and almost speaking in a way like she's running a con on Hayes, where it's like, when's he gonna find out about you? How long is he gonna stay by your side? Then he hits her walks away, and then she fucks Costner and slips and away she, in the middle of the night. She, and I'm like, where'd she go? I, and and I just, she leaves the kid She leaves the kid behind. with the Chinese but people. I could not understand, is this supposed to be a little bit confusing and a mystery for me, or am I supposed to get what's happening? Here? Yeah, I didn't know what was it's going on. It's not that there. I didn't get it. It's that I didn't get whether I was supposed to get it, <laughs> I which is a little bit of trouble. I don't know that we're supposed to get half this movie's plot movements really. Which is a huge thing to ask of, not to speak ill of our older citizens, but Costner is kind of pitching it at the 50 plus crowd. And he's essentially saying to them, watch my movie, then come back in six weeks and you're going to have to remember kind of who everyone was and where they were. And then we're going to do more. And then I'm going to try and make the third one to get it to you pretty soon. You know, but it's like, yeah. not like TV where it's like, yeah, you can binge this or yeah, yeah like once a week we'll do like one check-in. Do you think he's going to do a previously on Horizon Heel. an American Saga chapter he one sizzle reel at the beginning of part minutes. two? Couple minutes. A couple minutes. Come on, Griffin, a couple minutes. No, I agree. Can we talk about how good Giovanni Ribisi's agent is? <laughs> oh, yeah. no, because of his fourth <laughs> billing? Yeah, yeah, he gets the end. Here's the billing on this movie. Kevin Costner, Sienna Miller, Sam, Sam Worthington, Worthington, and Giovanni Ribisi? Am Let me I see if it's on the um, poster. My memory is that everyone else is on a split card. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think that's it. Like, yeah, I think you're like right. Danny, Wilson, Danny, Danny Houston, Houston. Yeah. It goes two cards to three cards quickly. And Malone, Ribisi. Ingenaro, right. Lee, Bauer. Yeah. Now, Ribisi also had single card billing in Avatar The Way of he Water, sure a film where he appears on a, a video screen that someone else is watching. Yeah, but he's in the rest of them. For five seconds. We should remark upon the fact that, you know, of course, Avatar. Yeah. Dances with Wolves. Often compared to Dances with Wolves. And now Costner is using multiple Avatar actors <laughs> in his yes. part one of a multi part saga, Cameron esque. Vanity project that will have all kinds of future plots but that you'll has see later. Been Cameron's thing where he's like, "Look, there's a larger 18 part story I'm telling across these Avatar movies." Similarly, keeps on getting bigger and bigger, but he always keeps saying, "Like the movies will stand on their own. There will be self contained arcs." Yeah, and they do. And what Which we were saying Cameron's about what we were saying about Costner or not a Costner about uh, Eastwood being able to like. Focus on the one. Focus thing. on one thing or distill right. it to some, like. I was waiting for some spine here of like, is there a, clearly a main thematic concern that makes these scenes we're seeing part one? You know, the correlation or whatever it is, because it is just so bizarrely organized that it does just feel like here's the start of it. Yeah. Here's the beginning of all my pieces. I do hope Piacon's in the next one. Uh, I forgot the it's too painful. It's too painful. I forgot that Glenn Turman also is in the uh, coming up this season on Horizon. Love Glenn Turman. One of my favorite guys. Glenn Turman, I like him already. 
put him in a hat. I like him even more. <laughs> yeah. He's just sitting in a chair oh, in he a does hat look and I'm pumping my when you When you Google him, yeah. the with first picture comes up. Him with hat? Him with a hat. Looking yeah. great. He looks incredible yeah. in a hat. Yeah. It's, well, and it's it's a picture of him with a hat and yep. then a picture of him not wearing a hat and he definitely looks better in the hat. He looks better in the hat. What else do we have to say? The daughter of Sienna Miller. Mm -hmm. Looks a lot like Sienna Miller. She does. I, I think she's great in it. Yeah. And I really like... I found it heartwarming when she cuts the flowers. Sure. Yeah. With the soldiers going off to fight in the are Civil we, War. Are we going to see Civil War I battles? No, I think that's like something that the idea is it's more like this is almost happening more because of what's happening in America. Right. Of like, we both don't have the manpower militarily to really be on the West. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's no stalling expansion. It's stalling it, but also it's making it wilder. And that the people who are going out there are kind of completely just doing it, you know, willy nilly. That's why I assume it's set at this point. Mm -hmm. And it's also just this kind of moment of like, like, there's that conversation Worthington has with Rooker where they're like, what do you think is going to happen? And they're like, I don't know, man. But, like, whatever happens, like, this is next out here, right? Like, it's going to be that, but then it's going to be this. Which is, Dances with Wolves is the same vibe of, like, it's coming for us, man. Yeah. Like, we don't really know exactly when. Well, no, it, it starts with the Civil War. Dances with Wolves is also set, it's set right at the end of the Civil War. But, yeah, but it's more, you know, just that vibe of, like, Everyone who's out in the open plains is like, we know this annihilation wave is approaching. Well, yes, like yes, from the yes, east, yes, basically. Yes. Like we don't know exactly the great how. White but wave is coming. Um, Elegaic. Except this is Dances of Wolves is about a culture that's being lost. This is more about right, like something that's being planted here forcefully, violently, mm -hmm. a culture somewhat that is destructively. Being right. right, you right. know. And we're watching how that works. It's an interesting idea. I think it doesn't totally work. You're not wrong in that it's very imbalanced of of uh, settler versus indigenous. Man, the massacre by the bounty hunters is a disgusting yeah. scene, and I if I found it vile and awful and necessary. Yeah, but exactly. It, it's, it's not romantic, and it's you know. What happens to those settlers is not right, of course, in the beginning of the movie, but this is women and children. They're waiting for the men to leave, and they are going to scalp these innocent victims. That is a good point, though, that it, it is a kind of impressively unromantic movie. Right? Like, I, I think Costner is the only one who is like, in his performance, and it's just in his bloodstream, serving up the, like, kind of idea of the Western in his character. But even but so... But he's an old, weird, sad, broken man. That's the thing. Even so, he's not in the main storyline. He's playing the blue bonnet in this, basically. Yeah, it's a little clownish in a way, this, like, plot he gets wrapped up in that he doesn't even really want to be a part of, and you don't really get how it's going to relate to Horizon. But you know what I'm saying? That, like, I know what you're he's saying, not... yes, he's got a hat on. <laughs> No, but also and, that. And a scarf. And yeah. it's big. A Everyone scarf else. looks like a pashmina scarf that my aunt gave to me for Christmas 12 Costner years ago. Costner knows that. That's why he put that there. The um, We're going to need yeah. a picture of that, Marie. I'll see if I can find one. Um, I, I just think most of the actors in this movie, and, and even the style of the filmmaking, he is not like riffing on Western movies as much as he is just like, this is what things were actually like in the West. I'm not saying it's like, incredibly gritty and stripped down and realistic but he's not you're, he's not in love with the romance of the thing not entirely he's in love with the like he said like the struggle and the grit of it but no not really romantic Ben you bringing up that that scene reminded me of a very like a, a really impactful moment where one of the one of the guys takes blood from the scalp and rubs it on the little boy's face as like a like a I don't know some machismo like war paint or whatever. And I was just like, Christ, this is like disgusting. You know, it's uh there's some there's some powerful stuff in it. It's just it's such a long movie that you know. <laughs> this yeah, look, you'll all tune in next week. And we'll have a better sense to some degree of what this is or isn't. I kind of yeah. think we said this a bunch already, but do we want to say maybe what we want to see in the next this one? This is good. This is good. 
I'll start. Beans. I'll continue. Bees. Yep. Uh, Costner uh, has to shoot some bees. Yep. Uh, no, beans are so important to you. the West. Yeah. Here, yeah. Someone just sitting down. Luke Wilson, let's say it. Yep. Yes. And, and and cooking a pot of beans. Yes. Yeah. And holding his spoon a weird way like this or whatever, yeah, 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 you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to see a big keg with three X's on it. That would be good. And maybe also at some point someone loses all their money and has to wear that keg like a barrel. Yeah. Exactly. With, suspenders, <laughs> with suspenders. With suspenders. With suspenders. Yeah. Yep. 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 I, I don't have a joke, but I just I'm, I want to see more of Isabel Furman. I think she's Love a very her. talented actress. She's such a talent and she's so perfect for this. She, yeah. So, uh, you know, more more of her, please. Did you see The Novice? I did. She's so good in that. She's great in that. Great movie. Shout out to The Novice. I'm hoping the film in the middle, they just show The Novice. <laughs> Costner comes on screen and is like, and now a pause. And he it's wheels out a TV. Oh, a fucking boat. <laughs> yeah. He's like, do you like her? She was in another movie. I'm going to load the VHS. My friend Alejandro's bit he used to do about how long Atlas Shrugged was, where he says in the middle of the book, they just read another book. It's funny. They, like in the middle of Atlas Shrug, one of the characters reads Moby Dick and all of Moby Dick plays out. And then it just says, wow, that was a good book. Good book. Call me Ishmael. Am I yeah, right? You could just start putting other movies into Horizon. Yeah, I hope to see more of the many plot lines in Horizon, and I hope they continue to not interweave or end in any way. <laughs> Stick to the plan, Kev. <laughs> there, there's one full yeah. speed ahead. I won't say. I want actually new stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there probably are. It's fucking Glenn Durbin or whatever. Yeah, I, w- I was, I was telling some of my my girlfriends that we saw the movie, and one of them who has a friend who is an actress who I will not name. But she um, was asked to read for the saga. Mm-hmm. A part that was in this film or not yet? Unclear because okay. she mentioned that there was a lot of sexual violence. Interesting. And that I did not really see as part of part one. So I'm curious to see if that's a big part of part two and how that will be handled. Because, I mean, Costner keeps talking about, I mean, we, about women and their you know, their role in Westward expansion. And I'm like, hmm, look, it are we going to get more explicit about like that? whatever they're setting up with Ella Hunt is going to come to a head in some way. Um, throughout history, women have longed to clean themselves and their families. <laughs> That's what he says. Uh, this film came out June 28th, 2024. And a great weekend for Hollywood. Yeah, it just feels weird not to release a movie on July 4th. I've complained about it before. I'll complain about it again. Griffin is really upset about July 4th weekend this year. I'm really angry what about it. What comes out? Despicable Maxine. Me 4 and Maxine is the second widest release of July 4th. And there's so many movies that feel like they should have gone onto July 4th instead, <laughs> leaving other weekends empty instead. Number one at the box office, Griffin. Mm-hmm. Number one at the box office is still Inside Out. Two. With $57.5 million in its third week, it's made $1 billion in the globe. A movie that I think is pretty mid. I still haven't seen it. I was not very impressed with it, but you know what? I'm happy that it Safe keeps... cinema, basically. Yeah, and Disney Again. breathing down. It is funny. It just feels like for the foreseeable future, two movies a year are going to get credited for saving cinema. Right, it's like, and in between those two movies, every time people are going to be like, is this the last stand? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Instead of seeing Inside 2, how about go outside? Number two at the box office, Griffin. <laughs> I thought that was funny, Ben. No, it's just a genuine, like, come on, guys. Well, let's all go outside by but wrapping this episode it's up. It's too hot. I like that. I like being inside with air conditioning. Well, I think that's part of why Hollywood is back better than ever, baby. All yeah. of its films Probably are shown with air studio, conditioning. Go to a movie theater. What Maybe to see? see the number two film at the box office, which is Quiet Place Part Two, which, if Inside Out were not fully fucking dominating, I think would even be getting. More credit for like, is this movie safe? Yeah, it made a lot of money. In my opinion, a pretty good movie. It looks good. I, you know, Deadline, who is so fucking cynical with their box office reporting every yes. single weekend. I would load your Alamo app and see if you can get some some tickets to this if you're going to go right Quiet now. Quiet Place? Yeah. yeah I'm, gonna they're, they're packing I'm in. trying to engage with the episode at hand. Yeah, Quiet Place part. Uh, sorry, day one. What I was going to say is this weekend, when you were so expecting Deadline just fucking dunk on the Horizon number, which of course up in number three with $11 million. That's correct. Um, right, it didn't even make it to 12? No. It made 11. It was okay. down from the early front okay. estimates. 11. It made it to 11. Yes. Uh, An American number. They were like, look, is this a great number? No, but it's nice that there are 
multiple types of movies yes. at the theaters right now. Like they were There's just like four movies making over 10. Like it's like, yeah, they yeah. They were just like, this is the first weekend that looks a little normal in a while where we're not even going to ding this for underperforming because you're like, here's a movie for one audience. Here's a movie for another audience. They're all coexisting. That and part of it's one you know, assumes it will is hoping for a bit of a July 4th run, you know, in a mild way. But the quiet place movies. Shh, sorry. There's been a growth in opening. Yeah. For all three. Right. Yeah, it's, pretty much. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's look, it's just, a, I don't think it's a masterpiece or anything, but I think like the, the amount of interest I had in a quiet place prequel was so little. And I only just found out it's the pig guy. Like, Right. For the pig guy to essentially just make a small movie about grief and dealing with your cat while the world is ending is exactly what I wanted him. This is all these big bets that people feel like are failing and are showing that audiences don't care about cinema and, you know, fucking whatever. I'm like, quietly, Godzilla, Modern Apes and Quiet Place are these franchises that do not dominate the fucking like blogosphere. We're not breathlessly reporting on everything that happens, every development, every fan theory. In between the movies, people kind of just chill out. And then when they come out, everyone goes to see them and then moves on. Um, I'm happy they exist. I guess we're going to have another Quiet Place at this point. But Almost okay. definitely. I wonder what the next one, if they're going to, I'm sorry, I wonder if they're going to keep building it out in other directions or go back to the Ellison Simmons saga. Mm-hmm. Number four at the box office. A film we both like. It's a movie we both like that's number four at the box office. It's called Bad Boys Ride or Die. Fun. It's making a ton of money. Number five at the box office. New this week is an Indian film. Oh, yes. I do not know the title. It's called Kalki 2898 AD. It's some sort of uh, sci-fi epic. Uh, Looks kind of rad. Uh, It's, you know, uh, Telugu language you know much like it's from that sort of um sphere of indian cinema talent yeah so um i don't know it looks kind of cool <laughs> looks looks sort of a oh fuck rebel moon coded god i had to struggle to make my stupid joke because i already forgot the name it's giving of Zack scars. snyder's stupid <laughs> fucking thing can i get some credit for that joke it's giving scars i love it yeah, very funny oh, the only problem with it of course is that the r-rated cut of uh the scar giver has a different name oh, jesus yeah Christ. it's called like strawberry tales forever or whatever i mean like i don't i can't keep track there's scar four different giver titles is such a funny title to give someone because you're just like you mean the guy who cuts people no they give scars uh, also in the top 10, uh, the bike riders, a.k.a. dry turkey dinner. That's you know what? I'm, what? I'm, coming, I'm coming out Jesus on record. Jesus Christ. David's being David, so... David hates the bike riders. The problem with this movie I getting pushed really back like the bike riders. is that David's also been mean about this movie for it feels like four straight years. I just didn't like it that much. You, you guys are acting like I'm beating someone up in August. school. I want, you, I want you to say, I want Austin Butler to look you in the eyes. Uh, David. David. And then I need you to say this, that to his face. Me never. I would be like, ah, oh, A, B, you're great. <laughs> uh, you know what's quietly, even though, Shh. even though it's going to be profitable and no one's complaining about it, what I think is quietly kind of an embarrassing box office number. Is it number seven? I think so. The Garfield movie? Yeah. Yeah. Considering it's made 90, it came out in May when everything was flopping and people were like, the sky is falling. It had two weekends at number one with very little competition and it's going to crawl to 100. I think there's two reasons for Compared its failure. To Inside Out exploding, where you're like, clearly there's a family audience that was very eager to see things. And even still, a lot of parents were like, wait a month for Inside Out. We don't need to go see I Garfield. I just think like everything about it is so uninspiring. This? It was just sort of like, Chris I bet you Pratt, want to see Samuel another L. Garfield Jackson. movie, you fucking idiots. And as much as Garfield has endured, I think Garfield's peak as a sort of pop culture figure was long ago at this point, right? Like, Yes, does anyone really get excited about the idea of know. Garfield? I don't know. Do you, Ben? Do kids, you like cats? Are, I mean, I, are kids like, into Garfield? I don't think so. I don't think they're that into Garfield. They're into a cartoon cat. And so that's sort of enough to get you over the line. That's like the bare minimum number. It does kind I'm of a feel. Heathcliff guy. Well, yeah. Well, that guy's weird. A lot of our listeners are Heathcliff guys. Number nine at the box office. You know Sorry, number eight is Kingdom of the Planet I, of the I Apes. I do know that because one of them got me subtly featured in a Heathcliff. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes, they wrote in a letter. Yeah. Ben um, and his cat pig from. Well, my cat Fletch likes to get wet. Right. That's what it was. Yeah. 
uh, Kings of Planet of the Apes, a movie I, you know, I was sort of like mildly yeah. into. It's definitely a little slow at times. Is a movie Got that stuff. feels like it has three different movies in it. Yeah. And Some, one, one really fun one. Number nine in the box office, God bless it, is Yorgos Lanthimos's Kinds of Kindness, which is almost three hours long. A crowd pleaser. And <laughs> makes Horizon look like sweet syrup going down. You know what I mean? Like, have you seen it yet? I have not. Are you interested? I am interested. I want you to see it. Has anyone here seen it? Nobody? No. no. I got a lot of stuff on my to see list. I mean, it's... it's 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 rough out there. There's so and I was out of the city for a while. And so I'm like trying to pick and choose what to see. I had to see Horizon. We've been recording a lot of episodes, too, for a couple of reasons. Yeah, but like also you've got your evenings. Go see a cinema. You know what I do in the evenings? You honk shoe. You yeah, get like Kevin Costner. Abby I get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Fair enough. Uh, number 10 <laughs> in the box office is a film called Jet and Juliet. Which appears to also, I think it's a Punjabi movie. I don't, I don't know much about it. Uh, but you've also got If hanging around. Uh, it's made it $110 million. Another example of the Garfield effect of like family audience is so hungry that it feels like any family movie you put in theaters will basically crawl to 100. Right. Uh, and then Thelma, which is like obviously going to be like a nice little sleeper hit this summer. Which is a lovely movie. Um, so I uh, I saw uh, Powell and Pressburger's Gone to Earth. Mm -hmm. last yeah, that, night that made forty eight million dollars last week. Gone to Earth? No, I'm joking. Uh, I've never seen it either. It's been recently restored. It is incredible. Is it playing somewhere? It's, it's a Moma's design. doing a or Moma. It's yeah. Moma. Moma's doing a full Powell and Pressburger retrospective. It's playing again on August fifteenth. Okay. I think. But anyway, uh, I bring this. But that's we have tickets for midnight showing of Horizon American Saga Chapter <laughs> Two. That night. Fuck. That's the 15th is the midnight. <laughs> Don't worry. Go see it. Leave 10 minutes in. Watch the Power Pressure where we go back. Horizon will still be going. You'll pick it up. So either I bring this up. Jennifer Jones, right, is the star yes. of this oh. film. And this Love is a her. famous, like, David herself. O. Selznick yeah. on amphetamines, like, sending them a lot of studio notes. Yeah. Making them, you know, do a lot more close-ups on Jennifer Jones. Re-editing the movie two years later and releasing it under, it? Re yes, releasing right. it under a different title. But, like... Anyway, incredible film. Um, and Michael Powell's widow is Thelma Schoonmaker, the great editor. And she uh, has been responsible for, like, I guess, shepherding his legacy and getting... He, she and Scorsese have spearheaded a lot of the restorations. And uh, she was in attendance at the screening at MoMA last night, just in the audience. She didn't Hell introduce yeah. it or anything. And she was yep. sitting behind me. Cool. A couple of rows. Yeah. And I was like freaking out. And yeah. I was taking a lot of selfies uh -huh. just to like get her in the background. Sure, but shoulder. it's like, you know, it's kind of not, it's a little blurry. And I kept sending to people, oh my God, Thelma's behind me. Right. Thel and you, and, and they everyone, thought you meant so everyone's funny. like, June Squibb. Yeah. Like she owns the name now. <laughs> Squibb's rocking it right now, man. Squibb's rocking it. We love Squibb. <laughs> Star of uh, Scent of a Woman, June yeah. Squibb. June Squibb. June Squibb's also the lead of Scarlett Johansson's directorial debut. Is that right? I just feel like there's all this press about Thelma's her first time in a leading role at mm -hmm. like 94. She's not 94. She's uh, 94 years old. David? That She's 94? This is what I'm saying. I think she might be playing yeah, younger in Thelma. <laughs> like, she's I'm playing like a, an 88 year old. 94 is so she's fucking really, old. She's kind of like needs to tell me her diet yeah. <laughs> given given if that she's doing this well yes. at 94. And I'm saying she's got another one in the cam where she's the lead. And you're saying ScarJo directed this? ScarJo directed a movie that June Squibb's the lead in that they just finished filming in New it's York. Called Eleanor the Great. Yes. And it's about a 90 year old so once again she's way out of this is actually terrible casting. Floridian woman who strikes up an unlikely friendship with a 19 year old student in New York City. Hmm. It sounds a bit like Lost in Translation perhaps. Who's the 19-year-old again? Erin Kellyman, who's the girl from, oh, like, yes. uh, Solo yeah. and stuff. Yeah. She's right, she's in Enfys Solo, Nest. right? Yeah. Enfys Nest? The very freckly one, yeah. She was Enfys Nest. Enfys Nest? And she would tell a Geo 4 and Jessica Hecht? It's, I mean, it's a good kid. Jessica Hecht! Yeah. This episode's over. Yeah. I, this oh, has over. real <laughs> episode has been over energy. <laughs> Everyone's looking at their devices. David's typing a very long email. Yes. No, I'm not. I'm not taking long email. What? How dare you? Next week on the show, Horizon, an American saga, part two. 
Yeah. It's weird to think about. I feel like we're time traveling uh, that in a way. coming this soon, right? Yeah. It doesn't feel right. But nothing about this movie feels totally right, I guess. So that's the magic trick of Horizon, colon, an American saga, hyphen, what? After two? I guess that's just, you know, that's just what he did. Is this a Battlefield Earth level disaster for him? No. Is it a Dances of Wolves level triumph for him? Certainly not. It's something weird in the middle. No, he also keeps talking about the $100 million investment and people took that as part one is $100 million, and then it starts to sound more like, no, him shooting part one and part two are $100 million. And then recently I read a quote from him that yeah. almost made it sound like $100 million is the whole endeavor. A hundred, but it's $100 million of his own personal That's, investment. I believe what he was four. saying. I think he was kind of saying, like, I think I'm going to end up $100 yeah. million in the hole when all is said and yeah. done. But I also just don't know how much we should be listening to him about this. Like, I assume he has accountants who are drinking many poisons as he continues to make these movies. <laughs> but, like, they are the ones who actually know, like, what's at stake. He's been clear, like, look, my children will not be penniless. They just might not have my fancy waterfront properties. He's also, as we have now mentioned, in the middle of a divorce. Uh -huh. And possibly he's just kind of draining oh, no. the account. I don't have any <laughs> assets. <laughs> Sweetie, I'd love movie. to give you money, but... That might make its money back. I'll give you a chapter. <laughs> you want one of the chapters? What if the divorce settlement is she gets chapter three? Yeah, exactly. He might take try and pick, take it all the way to chapter 11. Ben? That was a little bankruptcy joke from old that was Hoster. Very funny from the Hoster. What's Kevin, uh, what's his Kevin Costner name? We have one more part oh, to figure this out. Fuck, didn't we figure out what it was? <sighs> yeah, I think so. Well, <laughs> it's again, we've been recording these all so like <laughs> scattered. <laughs> Stands with a vape. <laughs> I don't vape anymore. He doesn't vape anymore. I don't even freaking smoke anymore. <laughs> Stands with a chain? The post production like man? Post production man. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. funny. It's do, sort of a thinker, but it's, it's pretty a good. Bit of a thinker. <laughs> ben Hosley in American Saga Part One. <laughs> <laughs> now that I like. What was your joke? You oh you wrote when Marie and I bought tickets for Sunday afternoon. You wrote <laughs> Horizon Alone. Yes, that's right. You did. You and we were all like, huh? What <laughs> like, we were word? like, Ben, what, what 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 did autocorrect do to you? It didn't make sense visually. No, and I, I wasn't Horizon. Hold on, let me see if I can get it just perfectly right. And this is going to pay off in a sure. huge way. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Murray for being here, helping to produce the show. Thank you to AJ McKeon for editing, production, coordinating. Hellos. Wait, Hellosen. <laughs> Hellosen. Griffin, whatever Griffin said was Made better. Made more sense, right? I guess so. You put the A after the H. Well, because alone is right in there. Right. Hellosen. Thank you, J.J. Birch, for doing the rare new release dossier for a movie that has 30-plus years of development. Very good. Uh, good. Very good. Thank you to Pat Reynolds, Joe Bowen for our artwork, Leigh Mike Army, the Great American Olive for our theme song. Thank you to Kevin Costner for being the last true American. Tune in next week for... <laughs> Record scratch? That's Remember what, that's we decided on a do. horse noise. Well, I thought you were going to place the noise and then afterwards I'm saying record scratch to make it clear what happened. Okay, cool. So I think people have heard a perfect sound effect of a horse. And by the way, all of this is staying in. Of course. And then me saying record scratch and everyone's confused. Oh my God. Oh, the blank check guys fucked up. They recorded an episode when they thought Horizon Part 2 was going to come out one week later and then they never bothered to update it. Well, you're wrong. Here's the addendum. Here's the fucking epilogue. We're back in the studio. Not the epilogue. The intermission. Addendum. Yeah, but addendum uh, you know, to chapter one. No, this is an addendum slash epilogue for chapter one, of course. But it's like, it ain't over. It's it just over. taking a break. A week ago, we were rattled. We received the news that Horizon, colon, an American saga, colon, chapter two, had been removed from the schedule. Not postponed. Not postponed. Not uh, put on max. Just, uh, we're going to just 
whoop, no <laughs> for a minute while we figure this out. Date announced. <laughs> that was the energy, right? I think a lot of people interpreted it as this movie is never coming out. The movie has no, been that's not canceled. True. Right. It'll I come out saw some, some people doing that kind of hand wringing, which is wrong, which is part of why we're doing this to talk about the state of Horizon. They said, we're removing it. The important line in the announcement was, like, we are rushing this thing to PVOD and Max. Uh, chapter one yes. is being put on PVOD and Max uh, tomorrow, actually, when right. we're recording, mid-July. Yes. It will have been out for a, a while by the time this episode comes and out. I think there is the assumption that it possibly could do quite well on Right. I think correctly, their feeling was, well, this absolutely didn't work in theaters. If we're putting it's the weird because when I went to see it at yeah. ten o'clock at night, and a theater in Queens by myself. Well, no, it wasn't. It was filled with ghosts. That's oh, the thing. Costner yes. always has to remind us his biggest audience is haunting uh, audiences, right. ghost audiences right. his, from like yes. frontier times. Right. His key audience is ghosts who still buy DVDs at Walmart. <laughs> And, and women, how dare you? And women, female ghosts. Horizon who still buy has DVDs. made twenty eight million worldwide. Twenty six domestic. One point something foreign, okay? Yes. <laughs> Doing okay. I think they are correct in that they were like, look, we don't know if this is ever going to work, but if we release chapter two in a month, it is going to die a deeply embarrassing death. If you have to assume that no one's seen chapter two who hasn't seen chapter one, and that some of the chapter one audience isn't returning for chapter two. I do think Costner's correct, which he's always said that his audience is not necessarily an opening weekend audience. An They're an older audience, an older audience. And I was throwing out as an example, I was talking to uh, uh, Ben Simpson, producer of Thelma, a movie you and I both liked quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Fun movie. Um, that movie is uh, very, very similar to the relationship I have with my grandmother, who is 94, would fucking love that movie it would probably make her cry and she loves movies more than anything else and has not been to a theater in five years and i cannot get her to go back to a theater she just and i have this with some of my older relatives as well as sort of like i kind of just got used to not going and it's on my tv eventually absolutely. anyway yes. absolutely and i keep yelling at them and they they don't listen to me and also i'm like what else are you fucking doing well this is my thing but oh, whatever but Ben was talking about like, oh, you know, it's going to VOD and streaming soon. And I, you know, it's a, always a bad sign if you announce the things to her. I'm not relaying anything that's uh, untoward here. Right. But it, like this battle that we're constantly talking about of like, if you announce the streaming date the week after your movie comes out, are you shooting yourself in the leg? And I said, no, for Thelma, there's genuinely a huge audience for that movie that was never going to go to theaters. And that movie has done very well in theaters. It's been one of the few successful, like genuine nice indie, indie uh, summer counter programming releases since the pandemic. Yep. But no question that movie is going to explode on streaming and VOD. And that might happen with Horizon or it might not. But I think it it'll probably do all right. It's smarter to push it over to those platforms and let it play out that way for a bit and see if there's a way to drum up more excitement for chapter two. When the news hit, my phone blew up. I imagine you guys, David certainly had a similar thing. Certainly all the various blank check group texts were blowing up. And people, a lot of people I know were like, oh, you guys are fucked. Did this fuck you over? How much are you stressing out right As now? As if. Best thing to ever happen. Of course, it I makes it all way more interesting. And some people are going to say like, cope shit. You're fucking coping. You're, you're saying I'm not big mad. Genuinely, this is the best outcome. I agree. Yeah, I think... One, it's fascinating. There, you know, like immediately, I'm starting to see on like you know film Twitter and Letterbox and stuff, people being like, you know, they 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 came for Horizon, and I will now speak out. Horizon Horizon's is going now to, gotten a new it's gone from like, level of underdog status, right? Like weird kind of vanity, like dad movie to like like instant weird cult classic. We thought there was a binary. We thought either this movie is going to have some weird sound of freedom out of nowhere over performance, which would have been an interesting cultural narrative, but not that interesting to our podcast other than Kevin proved them all wrong. Or it's going to just belly flop. And it felt like that's where we were. And it was kind of a sad note. And you're like, does he get to make the other two? Who fucking knows? This is the most interesting note. Much like Horizon Chapter 1, our miniseries now is on an indefinite cliffhanger. Exactly. And we'll be back. But who knows when? Who 
fucking knows. And there will we no see way. it in theaters or will we watch it on Max no or will it get shuttled over to uh, Crackle? Like, who knows? And I'm not being insane here, but like I was talking to a lot of people who were like, I kind of feel bad for him. The thing is a conclusive failure. They'll eventually put part two in theaters or streaming or whatever, but the dream is done. He'll never make it to part four. I'm not betting on him, but I think it is stupid to bet against him. And part of his strategy always for this shit has been like, if people don't like it as a movie, I recut it as a TV show in two years. And then I resell it and I make more of my money back. I could totally see a scenario in which, I'm not betting on it, but I could see a scenario where in this does better than expected on VOD and streaming. They put chapter two on VOD or streaming. He spends a year or two building up the money to basically be able to sell back to Paramount Plus or someone. I will cut the first two chapters into episodic if you give me X amount of money to do the rest of the story that I want to play out in TV and I'll just design it for TV at that point. Wait, hold on. I could see that happen. But you're saying he would put out part one as a movie. Part one went to theaters as a movie. Then he part would two re-release would... it as a series, including part one recut. Maybe. People have know. done this. Chop it up. Like Tarantino did that. Tarantino did it with Hateful Eight. He's yeah. been saying he's going to do it once upon a time in Hollywood. He did it very quietly as an experiment for Netflix. Boz Lerman just did it with Australia, a movie he shot 15 years earlier. Okay. Recut as a miniseries for Hulu. It's a thing that's been happening on a low level. And so many people, I feel like their response to Horizon was, if this is what he wanted to make, why didn't he do it as a TV show in the first place? Sure. And I think the answer is what David fucking said in our main episode chunk, which is like, fuck you. Movies are better than TV. Everyone's been saying TV is like long movies. He should make a movie that's like long TV. It's time for like the revenge, right? But I also think there's a certain strategy to it where it's like, he always could have sold this as television. Oh, for sure. Why not try to make it a movie? And if it fails, then it's like, I guess I make it TV instead. Versus if he made it TV in the first place, that'd be depressing. Here's my question, Griffin. My Costner rankings of the four films he's directed. Oh, right, which we had put which off. Which we had put off because we assumed part two was coming. Chapter yeah. two. Yeah. Do I put Horizon over Dances with Wolves? Is that a weird thing to do? I, I, I think one cannot. So it's Open Range, Dances with Wolves, Horizon, and American Saga Chapter 1, The Postman. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm tempted to put Postman over Horizon, but only because Horizon is not a complete movie. It just kind of can't be judged. I do think... I felt like it resolved all the different threads. <laughs> My only question is... Yeah. And we'll find out, I think, one day. Does chapter two have a little more of an ending? I don't Because at least no. Costner knew. More storyline. Well, this no, 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 but like, it's like chapter one ends yes. with a trailer for chapter yes. two, which they were filming concurrently, blah, 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 blah. They have that footage. But chapter three obviously had just sort of started work when, you know, so it's like, does chapter two have a little more of a like, okay, there's more we can do and there's more story to tell, but here's the end. This is my big question. My big question is, in his grand narrative, do all the plot lines converge? Does everyone make it to Horizon in part two? And then the story is cooking for parts two, three, and four. Or is Horizon, everyone converging, the end point of chapter four? Is it the beginning of chapter three? So the first two movies are set up? Like, there is no clarity on this. When he's been saying, I've already started filming chapter three, I have since heard that possibly what he has shot is what would be the coming soon montage at the end of chapter two that he basically shot he like put up enough money to do like a week or less of like grabbing some elements to tee up chapter three which then he was hoping hoping to get the money from the first two to make i don't fucking know but i think this remains one of the weirdest experiments in the history of hollywood and i think it's weird liminal space outcome right now makes it even more interesting i th i i the one thing that's absolutely happening is some version of chapter two is coming out because it, it he has shot no, no, the entire happen. fucking thing. Oh, yeah. No I one's just seen it. There's no clarity on what level of cut exists, <sighs> but something's going to come of it. I think it's going to be released direct to a streaming service, likely Max, I think, because there is sort of an existing relationship with WB for these two movies. It's possible it could be re released first direct to PVOD and then Max. 
the chances of a theatrical release seem slimmer. I will say that I have heard that Costner's original take was let's release chapter two more like four months later, His ori- not six yes. weeks apart. His grand dream was to have four movies come out in the span of 12 months, four months apart. And that's when he hoped he'd be able to make all four straight through. And then instead it became two movies, six weeks apart, which is really close. He's really just only allowed if your first part is going to really smash. Like the second Horizon underperformed, the idea of releasing chapter two, like basically a month later, seemed suicidal. Like that's, that's, that's crazy. Almost like every time you're, someone you're not giving has anyone time to really get to it. thing like this. It's like it's spring and fall, like summer I'm and winter. Say, yeah. Three loaded in revolutions is May and November. May, November. And, and that the is pirates did that too, basically. Right. No, what I'm saying is almost every other time it's different calendar years. Oh, sure. Pirates did two pirates years was apart. July yeah, yeah. and May. Right. Right. I think Back to the Future two and three were like summer 89 and then spring 90. That sounds right. And uh, they're usually you know, less than a year Lord apart, the but they put them in apart. different years. Right. Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, all those things. It's like same season every year, like clockwork. The six weeks thing is kind of insane. Infinity War and uh, a fucking Endgame were like one year exactly apart. Six weeks was going to be bold. Whose decision do you think that was? Who who decided on six weeks? I wonder what, what was the Warner strategy. Brothers. I think it, it was sounds, Warner Brothers. Yeah. I think it was them kind of being like, look, man, we've got our schedule. Yeah. You know, we've got trap, we've got Beetlejuice, we've got, you know, we so like Horizon is gonna go where we want it to go. Also, their exposure is limited because Warner Brothers just has a distribution deal on this. So for them, I think it was some degree of like, can we use this as a guinea pig pig for experimentation, right? And uh, I think the other part of it was truly that they were like, if they're six weeks apart, we save on marketing spend. Um, you basically probably, have one marketing it, campaign right? for the two movies. You just design one poster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Fear Street, which was the Netflix trilogy based on Earl Stein books, that at one point uh, our friend Alex Ross Perry was in, uh, uh, was attached to direct. That movie was originally developed at Fox before Disney acquired Fox, and that was supposed to be this grand experiment for them of we're filming three movies with three different directors back to back to back. The three directors will run their own post processes so that we can get them all finished at the same time, and they will be released in three consecutive months in theaters. And this was back in 18 or 19, and it felt like a radical idea, and it was like Fox just wants to try it. They want to see what in this weird mushing between film and television, is there a way to make a movie that feels like TV and has people come back every month? And the question has always can been, I, can I ask? Yeah. Have people come back every month? Well, what happened was instead in the pandemic, they sold it to Netflix and it just went up on Netflix. And I think they were released two weeks apart or some shit, but it didn't have the same thing. And I think the feeling with these things being so close together is like either the thing flops And by the time the second one comes out, people are like, what? Or if the first one's successful, are you cannibalizing it by have the second one come out and take screens away from the first one? And the only thing I can really think of that's kind of like this in like mainstream popular wide release studio theatrical strategy is the Star Wars re-releases of the special editions in 97 where they were like, Star Wars comes out in January, Empire Strikes Back comes out in February, Return of the Jedi comes out in March. But it was very different because those are archival movies. Right. It's different. Yeah, just obviously. putting myself in the viewer, myself, my shoe, myself in the shoes of the Put viewer. Put yourself in the shoes of the viewer, which you were alone at a theater in a story. That's right. Like, I'm like, oh, I love this movie. And then the sequel comes out the next month. Yeah. I guess if I really liked it, I would maybe want to show up. I would be probably more motivated but wouldn't I just also be motivated if I liked the first one to go see it a year later? Yeah. I just, I don't understand it. Like, even from like a financial standpoint, couldn't you make more money by holding back and then having just the first? Yeah, here's the argument. Go out and be streamed or, you know, yes. I, I don't know. It just that, well, that's like, why, sold physically. That's just why feels... that's what they're doing now. Yeah. Which feels like a course correction to like, oh, we've actually made a mistake by setting these movies up to not let chapter one have a full life cycle. And this would only work if chapter one was an out of the box phenomenon in theaters and the excitement was so high that basically people were like, I got to see chapter two immediately. 
and or by the time chapter two came out six weeks later, people could be like programming marathon screenings yeah. where it's like there's a higher ticket price for six hours of Horizon. You sit, you watch both of them. But I think the answer is there was not a lot of confidence in this movie. They were like, look, if it's a low key phenomenon, if it has a rabid passion, but it's smaller, why not just get them twice in two months? Why not fold in the marketing campaigns? And especially if you're not the studio that made the movie. All of this is interesting. It's yeah. very interesting. It's going to work out in some way. In some way. And, you know, 100% chance chapter two will be seen. In some form, somewhere. The over-under on three and four? Maybe, maybe, I hate to say this, Kevin. Is there some compromise where you can just do one finale movie? Sure. Rather than two? Yeah. Maybe that's the conversation people start having. Yeah. He obviously had this whole pitch of like, you'll see. Yeah. And you'll be hungry for more and the ball will keep rolling. And yeah. now it's more of a sort of like, okay, how can we, how can we get this done in any way? But that pitch was as if chapter one would be the greatest appetizer you've ever had. And you'd be like, bring on the fucking main course. And especially, essentially, it feels like chapter one was handing out napkins and silverware. And being like, I swear to God, what we're cooking up in the kitchen is going to be delicious. And you're like, Kevin, I'm so fucking hungry right now. And you've not fed me any. There's not even bread on the table. I want some bread. I I'm hungry. Love some bread. I'm I... hungry, too. Uh, goodbye. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping well, this. Oh, well, what else uh, is there to say? Hey, we don't know. Well, here's what I want to say. And I do think this is important to say. Here's the other message I got from a lot of people that went along with, like, are you guys panicking right now? There was a lot of hypothesizing about, well, what are they going to do? How are they going to fill this blank spot on the schedule? And here's the answer. Next week, David Lynch. Yep. We're Enjoy. going straight into Eraserhead. People thought we were going to use this to put Waterworld on Main, yeah. to do a Ben's choice, yeah. do any other kind of thing. Yeah. No, guess what? Actually, our schedule was a little crunched and stressed in terms of fitting all this stuff in by the end of the calendar year. And this has given us a little breathing room. It's worked out great. Also, quite possibly, we will have to loop around and schedule Horizon Part 2 sometime in the fall. Yep. Could or happen. next year. Who knows? So right now, everything is just moving up one week earlier. Eraserhead starts next week. Yep. David Lynch, Twin Pods, Firecast with me. Yep. Horizon, Chapter 2, question mark, question mark, question mark. That's but right. whenever it happens, we will cover it. Your Kevin Costa ranking, we said. My yeah. Kevin Costa ranking, I said. Yeah. I think he's it's the, been fun, Kev. He's the weirdest normal man in American history. I'm spinning this oil right now. Yeah. Spinning. I'm I, spinning. I just think he's going to. Anytime people are like, he's done, he's cooked. Kevin's like five years away from like a surprise and a second win. Big Kev, the cause. What sandwich should I pick up on my way home? That's an incredible question. Mm, what are you in the mood for? I don't know. Turkey. It's too bad Blimpy's closed. Mm. Ham. We had one of the mm. last Blimpy's that was mere blocks away from our studio and it closed. I don't think a Blimpy's is being good. I was yeah. joking. The oh, point okay, is great. it's maybe the worst <laughs> option. Yeah, it's the worst ever. It is the funniest thing in Blimpy the 30 Rock season things. finale or the series finale Okay. when they're trying to tie up all of the narrative threads and they devote 30% of the running time of the finale to in the lunch rotation of who gets to pick the lunch order, it landed on Lutz. And which, he wants Blimpies, right? And they just do everything they can to block his choice. That sounds funny. It's so good. I should rewatch 30 Rock. Yeah, it rolls. Okay. You know what's another funny one? Quiznos. Yeah. Well, Quiznos is like gone. They or? also, both of them barely exist. That was just the weirdest one where they were like, the sandwiches are bad. And I'm like, okay, but they're toasted. And I'm like, but they're bad. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> but we oh, did toast suck. them. <laughs> yeah. And what about your mascots? They're ugly. <laughs> so they what? look bad. Yes. But also they sound annoying. Do you guys like Subway? No. Oh, oh, shit. OK, well, <laughs> it is that. <laughs> but we did toast it, though. And I'm like, uh -huh. <laughs> here's the thing. It's the toasting thing totally worked on me. Of course it did. It worked yeah. on everyone for a, a year or two. And then that was the head for <laughs> one visit. Yeah. I went too many times. Quiznos is one of these things where I feel like the parent company has shut down, but individual yeah, franchisees, franchisees exist, right, and they're yeah. basically lawless. <laughs> the last time no, I went... No, it's kind of like a Horizon situation. Exactly. They've gone oh. beyond the borders. There was a Quiznos near the AMC 34th Street that I think finally closed. Sure. That was like the one still left in Manhattan that I would go to sometimes if I was seeing a movie there. 
And the last time I went, the guy who was working the register was not only not wearing any of the like Quiznos, like shirt, hat, the things that signify that this person works here. Right. He was wearing his backpack. Uh, oh, cool. He well, was just standing he at the register to, uh... with the backpack. And I was like, did you just get here? Are you about to leave? Do you just not care? And it, 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 Quiznos felt like Horizon. It felt like a town of possibility. He had to uh, keep his stuff on his uh, back. That's why he had the backpack. Sure. I just looked up the nearest Quiznos. Where is it? It is in Connecticut. Great. How far? Are we talking Western or Eastern, what baby? Town? It is in uh, Orange, Connecticut. Oh, boy. That's not that close. No. <laughs> Orange is pretty far. In fact, pretty far. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of near New Haven. Like, yeah. that's in the middle of there. And so, by car, it is... Uh, it's a good two, two and a half. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that's yeah, a Patreon yeah. app. That's a slot filled in 2025. Why the fuck would we go to quiz though? Because we brought it up in this episode. What that's do you mean? not enough of a reason. What kind of question is that? It's because lore now. Because we brought it up in this episode. <laughs> it's lore now. Wait a second. This is weird. I just got an old flyer from a mysterious source, and I'm looking at it, and it just says, Quiznos, Orange, Connecticut. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pack up my fucking wagon. Your BC did that. And journey. That's just for BC. For BC did that. He just printed that out. This guy is fucking printing flyers. He's shooting movies. He's fucking lensing indie horror. Oh, that guy lenses like no, no other. Yeah. David is on his phone. I'm literally ordering like, a sandwich. What should I get? Thank you all for listening to our Kevin Costner series. Yep. Uh, we the will same see sense you. of closure that the last Kevin Costner movie had. We leave you. We leave you with nothing but a sort of whisper hooks. of exactly. Yes. Of what could happen next. Yeah. Just imagining the kind of sleepy time sex scenes that might be coming. Should Kevin ever finish his saga? Oh, God. He's going to get laid so weird next time. <laughs> I don't know how, but it's going to happen. Tune in next week for Eraserhead. Uh, that's right. <laughs> no, you're not wrong. I'm not going to repeat the credits because we did it before in the original part of the episode. And honestly, ending. you just need to record the credits and we put them at the end of the episode. Marie was supposed to be here. She showed up in studio and then she puked a bunch. <laughs> yeah, for an episode that's coming out in fucking December. We miss you, Marie. <laughs> November. Yeah. Yeah, miss you, Marie. Feel we'll better. see you soon. Uh, and as always, I think Kevin's going to pull it off. We're getting all four. Yeah.